a very good morning to all of you. Uh, we are on the last day of uh, Atal AICT sponsored online FDP on the contemporary advances in sustainable and integrated infrastructure. And I hope uh, the last four days uh, were totally, uh, you know, informative. And uh, I think everyone uh, just gained some uh, very interesting knowledge respective of their own uh, specializations. So today, uh, without due any much, I'm going to uh, introduce the speaker of today's uh, session from 9 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. That is the session number 13. So today's expert is Dr. Rohit Tiwari. Uh, he's going to present uh, on modeling and simulation of transportation and geotechnical systems. Uh, Dr. Rohit Tiwari is presently working as a lecturer, assistant professor at the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering, UNSW, Australia. He did PhD in Infrastructure Engineering from University of Melbourne and MS Research from IIT Delhi. Dr. Rohit is keen to understand the performance of geostructures in dynamic loading conditions for ensuring a safe and reliable infrastructure system. His primary research interests lie in the areas of geotechnical, earthquake engineering, and performance based seismic design of geostructures. He has a strong background in experimental investigations of seismic actions in earth retaining structures and calibration of numeric non linear material models. Rohit Sir has also worked with industry and gained experience in construction and structural design projects. Having a strong interest in academic teaching, he also taught several undergraduate and postgraduate courses in Australia and in India. While teaching, Dr. Ruit has always tries to relate the concept to the learning from industry and research so that the students could develop a better understanding and realistic imagination of field conditions. He has published around 20 research papers in reputed international and national journals and conferences he also awarded as a best student paper award from Australian Earthquake Engineering Society, that is AESS in 2018. Prestigious Melbourne Research Scholarship by the University of Melbourne from 16 to 19 and Project Fellowship by IIT Delhi India from 2012 to 2014. I heartily welcome you, sir. And it's an honor for all of us, uh, for you to be connected with us and uh, uh, for the session on this wonderful topic. So I request uh, you to share the screen, I think, and uh, we can, uh, you know, start with your session. Thank you so much for the introduction. And actually, I don't know your name, so I'm so sorry for this. Okay, so uh, my name is Yaman, actually. Yeah, thank you so much, Yaman, for the introduction. And welcome, everyone, to this wonderful session organized by Manorajna International Institute for Research and Studies under the uh, faculty, Atal Faculty Development Program. So today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, my own research, which uh, we are conducting from 2014 in the areas of uh, underground structures and earth retaining structures. And the theme of today's talk is, is modeling and simulation of transportation and geotechnical systems. Um, so about me, Yaman already talked, and I think uh, we should start the discussion. So first of all, I just wanted to have a look about what kind of participant we have today. So if you can all please uh, scan this QR code from your phone using your phone camera and internet on, it will take you towards a link. And uh, there you will have these three questions. And I just wanted you to please indicate your response for these three questions, one, two, and there is one more three, and then click on the submit button. And then we can have a look in the uh, trends. So it will just, you know, to make the session more interactive. And I just wanted to have a have a have a feeling of what kind of audience uh, is there. So please go ahead. So what you need to do is open your camera and then scan this QR code. It will show you one link. Your internet should be on and just click on the link and it will take you towards this page and there you need to record your response. So 
So we just wait for one more minute. So far, I just got only three responses. Okay, so we got 13 responses and uh, two people are from geotechnical and eight are from structural engineering, civil engineering others one, two mechanical engineering and none, none, none are from other disciplines, so that's fine. And then 10 people are having master's degree, three are having doctoral philosophy. And very interesting and surprisingly, uh, 10 people, they are saying they are teaching engineering ethics in your course. If you're doing this survey in Australia, you'll get zero teaching engineering ethics. and. <laughs> And, and what is surprising, the um, high number for me at least. Okay, so I don't think we are getting more responses. So so now let's proceed to today's talk. So we are having more structure, guys. That's okay. Uh, okay, so uh, in order to understand the performance of a metro infrastructure against uh, some undesirable and disastrous loading condition, you need to understand first some 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 um, you know number came uh, why these structures are important and why people are started talking nowadays uh, uh, in terms of smart cities and how was the performance is related um, uh, for the satisfactory performance of you know um, this kind of geo structures. Um, uh, so, so, so first of all, have a look about Indian aspects and we are having Delhi Metro, uh, which is India's busiest and largest metro infrastructure system so far. And last year, the total track length in operation was around 348 kilometers, which I'm sure is more than this at, at present. And the total number of uh, ridership was around 4.7 million, very surprisingly around 19% of Australia's total population. And the cost of the metro was around 10 million, 10 billion dollars, uh, US dollars actually. So it was a, quite a very massive investment from government of India. And and uh, have a look about uh, about the trends in other metro cities in India. So Hyderabad Metro, uh, which is having 69 kilometer length, track length in operation, it was last year data again before COVID. And then Chennai Metro is 45 kilometer, and I think it's Bangalore Metro 42.3. Kolkata Metro is, I think, the oldest metro in India. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. And which is having a total track length in operation in around 34.7. I think the Kolkata Metro they have uh, are actually advancing the metro construction there. Um, so that's, I think, it, it will it may increase more than this in future years. And then Ahmedabad Metro is having um, a track, operation track length uh, 6.5 kilometer. And there are so many other cities. Um, uh, like Lucknow Metro and some other places in India where smart city proposal is uh, um, in a pipeline. So you, you, you need a smart uh, transportation system. And I think the Metro Rail is really very good solution for those uh, transportation uh, problems in Metro cities. So let's have a look in, in, the, in the global lens now. So we are having London underground tubes. Um, and um, interestingly, it is a fourth largest suburban uh, rail network. Uh, uh, in the world, uh, London Tube also having a track length of uh, uh, or uh, maybe 402 kilometer. It was last year data. I'm not sure whether they are doing more construction or not. And I think it's one of the most uh, one, one of one of the world's oldest uh, uh, underground um, transportation network, and which is having a daily ridership is 3.7 million, which is quite lesser than Indian aspects, but the track length is quite large, which 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 uh, emphasizes you know, uh, the lesser uh, everyday load uh, in intensity on London Tube compared to Delhi Metro. 
so we just discuss about the importance of uh, of of uh, of, of this uh, metro rail transportation system in uh, in an urban point of view in a smart city point of view uh, but but what what are the key elements and what, what are the you know uh, dangers or of of using or or um, uh, of of uh, which are of these kind of structures they are subjected to. So first of all, you need to understand first the key elements of any metro rail infrastructure. So uh, I'm sure uh, almost every person is familiar with this tunnel system, which is quite well popular when we are talking about uh, uh, this um, uh, metro rail uh, uh, infrastructure scenario. So now tunnels are really very really useful, and uh, in, in order to you know avoid the construction issues uh, in metro areas, especially when you're talking about uh, Indian prospects, uh, you're having New Delhi, and this uh, not a very you know good uh, strategy you can adopt in order to avoid the uh, issues which are generated based on the construction uh, if you're doing this on, on on the top of the ground but if you're doing underground construction uh, it actually minimizes the impact of those construction um, activities um, in in you know normal population so so tunnels are really very useful fast uh, and uh, one of the key elements of metro infrastructure system and when you have tunnels you have we're talking about now underground scenario so you need to have the subway stations as well in order to accommodate the people you know who are riders the coming uh, going in and coming out from the uh, trains and then metro rail flyovers also when you are you cannot avoid um, this um, in most of the situation and um, my gut feeling is uh, the tunnels are costing more than compared to the uh, flyovers so these are also uh, quite important part of metro rail infrastructures and then here it comes uh, earth, earth retaining structures. So whenever your train is going inside the ground, coming outside the ground, or there is a difference between the elevation in the ground, you need to construct those earth retaining structures in order to support the earth behind it. And uh, it ensure you a safe passage for your uh, metro trains. So today's talk, we I, uh, actually, I tried to divide, it, uh, divide this talk into two parts. So the first part is, uh, for 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about blast resistant design analysis modeling of uh, of, uh, um, uh, of of tunnel infrastructures, and and then then we'll break, um, and then next 15 minutes will be dedicated towards uh, the latest research which I'm doing uh, nowadays on earth retaining structures and uh, uh, and how they are performing during during the earthquake loading. So two different loading condition, uh, which is the most most. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, like most of the people are talking about uh, nowadays in terms of disaster point of view. So the disaster resilient design point of view, um, uh, two different loadings are uh, blast and explosion, and then here comes the earthquake. So 10 minutes discussion at the end of the discussion. Uh, so here it comes the learning from the past, some unfortunate event which happened uh, in the past because of terrorist induced activities or maybe some natural explosion inside the underground structures. So many people have lost their life in, uh, in, in several parts of the world. And especially if you're talking about the European perspective in London, from 1885 to 2005, there was around nine number of terrorist made um, explosions in, uh, uh, in the underground uh, like point of view. And, and 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 so many people have lost their life. So a recent incident, I think it happened in in near to uh, I think after 2000, which is uh, London underground bombings, and some people have lost their life and during that. So this this kind of incident it raised uh, uh, alarm whether uh, our underground structures or or maybe the metro transportation system they are resilient towards this kind of blast loading condition or not. So when it comes, uh, uh, so demand and supply in any 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 industry, this is this is the basic of you know generation of new ideas. So uh, when 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 this demand comes, like your structures need to be now blast resistant, and uh, you need to consider those those sort of uh, impact loading condition or the dynamic uh, environment into your design. So so the first question comes that why it requires and and what's the importance of doing this kind of design. Uh, so this blast resistant design is just not only, you know, designing something very massive just in order to uh, uh, avoid the uh, collapse of the structure. It is also about the blast resistance architecture. So the blast resistant architecture is also plays a really very important role. I am sure um, many people they have uh, nowadays using airport and airport. If you go near to the uh, airport building, you'll have this kind of barriers 
uh, the function of this kind of barricades are mostly related to this blast architecture. So let's say you, you, you are having very important building here and there's a truck which is full of explosive and then trying to come near to the building. So this barricade will not allow it to you know, pass on uh, the gates and it can never reach to this building. So you are avoiding the uh, danger because of this explosion in the first instance. And then uh, you are having this sacrificial one in addition to that. So no matter if it explodes here, it may destruct, um, make complete destruction of this area, but you, you, you still you may be able to save some lives here because of this sacrificial wall, it will damage. But this structure here will get very, very less damage. And you, you, may, able to, you may be able to save uh, hundreds of lives just because of this explosion. So this is called a blast architecture where you are not designing the actual structure uh, with, with very massive high, uh, like intense elements. You're just trying to avoid the danger or the, or the consequences of because of this kind of explosion. And then um, you need to planning for the uh, unwanted and unforeseen event. Unfortunately, in, in, in many parts of the world, uh, when we are talking about the fire and this blind blast design, people actually, they, they, they don't consider them as a, as a adequate, uh, you know, um, uh, design loading. Um, maybe some people will laugh on, 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 on us if you talk about this kind of design, because, uh, People, they, they are thinking it will never happen in the design life or the structure. And then uh, our reasoning should be, it, it should not happen in, in, in the design life of any structure, but it happens once or twice. You, you don't have any structure anymore there. So, so this is the beauty of actually, you know, this sort of reasoning. You are not preparing for everyday blast. You're just preparing one or two blasts in the, throughout the design life of, of, uh, of any building so, or any structure. So, so this is uh, uh, on some sort of uh, additional, you know, it's a part of the blast architecture. So you, where you are having sacrificial wall and research has uh, proven that this sort of uh, sacrificial small uh, weak elastic materials uh, can also, you know, help us to minimize the impact of the shock wave generated because of this explosion here. So this wall is a sacrificial wall. Of course, it will damage, but you can also decrease the intensity of the damage by using some some sort of uh, the sacrificial, um, very weak and uh, um, um, uh, material, basically, which which can uh, uh, we can uh, which is able to observe the um, the impact from this uh, shock wave generated because of this explosion inside the truck. Then here comes the modern performance-based design, which is nowadays a very hot topic of research. So whether or not we understand the performance of the structure. So each structure is uh, actually different, special, and uh, what kind of loading it is subjected to is, is the designer, is, is, is the person who are doing this modeling uh, in order to, you know, come up with a, a very good idea of the performance of the structure subjected to some certain loading condition. So this is what happened in Beirut. You, you, you cannot avoid or save the structure with that sort of intense explosion, but that explosion could be avoided if, if they were having proper monitoring and planning in order to you know, uh, identify that, that dangerous chemical inside the building and then you know, get rid from it. So you could have avoid that sort of uh, huge damage uh, and this is also comes under this performance-based design. So uh, this is really very important in order to understand the uh, performance of structures, uh, whether it's geostructures or whether uh, they, are, uh, they are buildings or um, bridges, any structures, this performance uh, needs to be quantified by, by the, all the stakeholders. When I'm saying stakeholders, it means the owner of the uh, structure, uh, it could be daily metro corporation the designer, the contractor, the construction contractor, the architecture, all those people have to come uh, under the same roof, sit on a bench and start discussing about what kind of, what level of performance they are expecting uh, from that structure. So that's really very important. So all these points are, are really very important in order to come up with a very robust uh, uh, numerical model or a very robust design based on that numerical model. Uh, you need to know what you are doing. Other, other, otherwise, you know, you just come up with some results and which makes no sense. So, once you once you quantify the danger, once you uh, uh, do the design basics, your calculations, find out uh, what's the right architecture of the blast, and then you can come up with a proper design. If you, if you don't do that, you will be end up with uh, like these two guys who made this bridge inverted and then feeling that something is not right. 
So, so this is uh, what you need to do, why you are doing this, and then how you do it. If you answer these all three questions together, your bridge will never be like this. Now, the second question come into the mind is how you, you analyze your structure against path loading condition. So, so the first first step for uh, getting a good plus register design is uh, design is having a safe structural static design. So when you are having static design as good, your structure is uh, uh, is uh, can withstand with uh, this static design. Then here comes the blast resistant design. So what you need to do, very simplified way, you can find out the the additional pressure which is acting on a structure uh, because of a, a blast, which can be you, you just need to give a number. What's the charge weight? What's the distance of the weight? And then you can use uh, maybe Indian standard or maybe very popular uh, uh, US standard for understanding or uh, uh, estimating the blast pressure on any structure. And it gives you a pressure profile and how you apply that pressure profile is also uh, given in this manual here. So you can just use it in order to get the blast loading, uh, different, different scenario for the blast loading in your structure. Um, then once you get the blast load, you have the safe static design. You apply that increased loading in your design uh, with different, different scenario, which is specified by UFC 340. And uh, based on that, you check your structural uh, capability, whether your structure is able to support uh, this kind of increased pressure condition or not. If it can, you don't need to do anything. But if it, it cannot, most of the cases it cannot. So then you come up with some sort of blast architecture so that you don't need to invest a lot. You, you won't come up with massive structural component section, which increase the cost of the structure. You just need to put, provide some blast resistant architecture and then revise the design based on this new architecture, revise this pressure. So, so you can come up with a robust uh, design without increasing the cost of the structure. Now, the question comes about the geotechnical structures and we are more focused about tunnels. So why tunnels are different? Why, whether you can use the simplified pressure uh, quantification and then apply it in the tunnel? The answer is no, you can't do this actually. Uh, people are doing this, but the problem with this kind of uh, uh, load quantification and then application on site the tunnel is it won't give you the correct answer. And here, here the solution, why, why, why it's not, you cannot, you know, actually quantify the dynamic behavior of tunnels in the blast loading condition. So people who are not familiar with the tunnel infrastructure, I just wanted to give you an idea of a transportation tunnel here. So there you have your buildings here, and that's the road, and then you are have, you just constructed a tunnel, excavated a tunnel um, in underground basically, and then apply some sort of concrete lining in it. And then you can use this, uh, tube basically for your transportation and sometimes you can use this tube for the transportation of your uh, materials as well like water or maybe sometimes petroleum gases as well so this is the tunnel infrastructure now what's happening in the tunnel and why it's different than uh, normal you know structural elements uh, in case of air blast loading so when i'm saying air blast loading it means your blast is happening in the air so this is the simplified assumption Otherwise, the problem, problem will be more complicated. So this is this is the tunnel infrastructure. This is your tunnel lining here. And that's the soil surrounding the lining. And then here, here you are having your air blast scenario here. And what happens is as soon as blast is started propagating, it hit the boundary of the tunnel. And that is very, very common. But the problem arises when the shock wave get reflected from the boundary. So this is the reflection of the shock wave. And then when it's reflected, the front is started propagating towards the boundary of the tunnel. So these sides actually. And then some, in many occasions, these two fronts will, you know, interact and then intensify the, the uh, shock wave intensity actually. And uh, then it propagates to together. So that reflection actually is maybe sometimes could be more than the actual shock wave, which initiated just after the blast. So this is the problem with the tunnel infrastructure. And if you are applying some simplified pressure pulse using UFC, you will just, you can just uh, calculate uh, pressure based on what UFC is giving to you in an air blast loading condition. But then it started reflecting and then you cannot uh, analyze the problem accurately with simplified methods actually. So what we have done is in order to understand the 
the performance of the tunnel structures uh, uh, under blast loading condition. We try to model it numerically and using the finite element methods actually, and uh, try to understand the behavior of uh, uh, tunnel infrastructures under different different conditions. So what we did is we tried to uh, uh, we tried to study the behavior of the tunnel different uh, under different thickness line thicknesses basically, and with the different shear strength of the soil and the different condition of the rock. So, and, 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 and there was one more study, actually it was for, for understanding how this alignment of the tunnel, if it's straight, how it will behave, it's in curvature, how it will behave under different loading conditions. So there was, this study was, this study is, I think one of this kind in the world, uh, very few studies has been performed so far in order to understand this effect of tunnel alignment on, it, on its blast response. So, Let's see the numerical modeling. So you have a, you have a tunnel domain here and which is having a tunnel lining, which is reinforced concrete material basically, and is, is constructed inside a soil domain here. So this is the length of the domain and this is the width and the depth of the domain. Uh, the boundary of the domain has been assigned symmetrical boundary condition. So this side and the back side is symmetry and this side and the other side is also symmetry. The base of the domain is fixed. I know this 20 meter could look quite less and compared to the geostructures, but the but this model takes you know five or six days to run in a computer which is having 32 processors and 64 GB RAM. And so 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 you imagine you cannot do this kind of analysis, you know, using the normal computer. Uh, so that, that's the reason try to optimize the size of the domain in order to it may give you some boundary effect but it's, 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 it's the results are still acceptable and, and could be published in in some good places so what, what we did was we modeled this kind of geometry uh, using a deformable uh, lagrangian element so the lagrangian elements are the elements where you are having your material is fixed at the node at the elements and 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 it cannot flow uh, so the material can deform inside the element based on the deformation of the element, but it cannot leave that element. And we have modeled this soil here and the tunnel lining, which is reinforced concrete based, based on the Lagrangian element and 3D solid elements have been used and, and having each node was having three degree of freedom, displacement degree of freedom basically. And then, then here we have uh, modeled the, the, the reinforcement of also based on the uh, design um, uh, which was provided by Delhi Metro Rail Corporation. So this was the reinforcement model using the beam elements and and then tried to uh, embed these beam elements inside this uh, reinforced concrete lining. So once you embedded what you are doing, actually you are trying to constrain the, all the degree of freedom of these uh, reinforcement cage here. And so the deformation of the cage and the deformation of the uh, this concrete lining will 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 be very very close uh, um, and but 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 this reinforcement will give additional strength to the lining and the material models are different so actually as you are modeling uh, the behavior of the concrete and the steel quite accurately if you're modeling material models are correct and so these are the details of uh, of reinforced concrete uh, lining and this is the these are the days for the reinforcement basically uh, so that's it about the modeling and then Let's see what happened based on applying different charge weights. So this is a charge weight. I already explained it. It was a air airborne charge and then um, situated at the middle of the tunnel lining with different different uh, charge weights: 25 kg, 50 kg, and 100 kg. So three different charge weights and has been modeled using the Eulerian element. So you cannot see the air, but we have also modeled the air surrounding the blast. So the air is more, air has been modeled surrounding the blast and then there was a charge at the center of the tunnel and both the air and the charge was modeled using using the Eulerian elements. So when, when I'm saying Eulerian, it means your material uh, uh, can flow, can interact towards uh, uh, from one Eulerian material uh, to, to the another Eulerian material. So Eulerian mesh can uh, can give you a freedom of uh, not by not fixing the material to uh, with the nodes of the 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 element. But the good thing is this urine material when it reaches here, it hit the Lagrangian uh, lining and the soil, and then give the deformation which we we need in order to get the deformation or the damage of the tunnel lining and the soil surrounding the tunnel lining. 
So let's have a look how the deformation happened and how the charge progressed. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, so this is a very quick video. So whatever you're looking at, this is the time here. And we are even not near to one, one second, 0 0.017. So it's 20 millisecond, the total simulation was for, and your charge exploded and then it started propagating towards the tunnel boundaries. That's the reason is you, you can see as it's propagating in this side. So these are the two boundaries of the tunnel domain. So this one, X, one, one, one um, you, you need at least, you know, for, uh, maybe few days to run just one model and then mesh is also controlled and not. So, so you need to come up with some solution which is having, you're having optimum mesh size of the model and the optimum mesh size for the explosion. So in order to, you know, avoid the time uh, even we are using some clusters or maybe the supercomputers, it may take maybe one or two days with that sort of modeling and with our our uh, workstations, uh, it was taking around two, three days sometimes for one analysis. So this was the blast modeling and the, how the blast propagate towards the tunnel boundary. So based on this, what we did was we just tried to replace the thickness of the lining uh, here. So one, the first analysis was performed for, for 350 millimeter thick lining for three different blast loads. The charge weight, which was your TNT, dinitrotoline, and then three analysis using 550 millimeter thick lining, and which was placed here. And then with the same three different charge weight, tried to analyze the deformation damage of the tunnel lining and the reinforcement and the soil surrounding the tunnel lining. And this was another study where we have tried to model differential strength scenario of the soil by varying the friction angle and the, and the stress strain constitutive response of the soil material. So now, so how, already I've shown you how the blast prop propagate. So at zero millisecond, you don't have any, any blast scenario the material was just quite uh, then then at 2.4 millisecond the blast started and then you get to see propagation of the wave and the cloud explosion clouds cloud was formed and then started propagating towards the non boundaries and then this 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 is really very good animation we captured during one of the analysis and what you can see based on this animation was how the blast is you know propagating um, uh, from, from, from the center of the tunnel towards the tunnel boundaries, and then how, how the damage of this soil domain and the deformation happened based on the propagation of the shock wave inside the tunnel. So let's have a look. So a blast and then it started propagating. And then when it reaches to the material and you get the deformation damage of the tunnel. So I have purposefully actually removed the concrete lining from, from this animation, just to give you a better idea about the deformation, more deformation of the soil surrounding the blast. So this was a, this, 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 this whole modeling took one year of time and we need to very, very day this response with some already available experimental data. So quite a, you know, um, uh, time taking process. So that's what would happen in case of the tunnel. So at zero millisecond, you have you have no damage deformation of the soil. At the five millisecond, you are having having some deformation of the tunnel um, soil basically. So I, again, there was there is no lining is shown here. This is the lining, but these four figures, I just take out the lining from the animation. So so all the deform contours basically. So so these are zero millisecond, five millisecond. And this is 10 millisecond, what happened to the soil, high deformation. And that's, this, this is the 15 millisecond getting more deformation. And then the, because of the shock wave is propagating from this place towards the boat ends of the tunnel, getting deformation is also propagating in the similar manner with the shock wave. And this is the deformed lining. You can see here and the deformation of the Langerangian mesh of the soil at 15 millisecond at the same time. So, now we highlight the the uh, the, the importance of uh, 
um, of different lining thickness actually, um, which we, 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 we tried to evaluate based on our fine element simulations basically. So you are having two different lining thickness and then this is the response. So try to, we try to extract there is an external crown and external side, side wall. So the crown is at the top, basically the side wall could be a left side wall or the right side wall. And then this is the center location of the blast, which is at around five meters. Okay, somewhere here, maybe here somewhere. And then, then, then uh, very interesting and it's not surprisingly actually, that you are 350 millimeter reinforced concrete lining is showing higher deformation compared to 550 millimeter thick lining and that that's 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 that's, that's actually um, a good point when you are looking at how much deformation is happening uh, what's the difference between these two but if you see very interestingly in the in the left side wall um, because of the suction at both of the mesh uh, of the tunnel lining um, are showing so showing the same same behavior actually um, uh, because of the suction uh, it was observed that both the lining is respective of their thickness it's not much difference has been shown uh, during the sidewall but at the crown you get high deformation with less thicker thicker lining compared to com high high thick lining with high thickness and that's the displacement in, in the reinforced concrete lining then this is the displacement in the soil so you can see when you're going towards the towards the uh, the charge and uh, with lesser thickness lining because the lining got damaged tar charge released the shock wave towards the soil and then you're getting higher mesh deformation and this is the same thing here so this is about um, about 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 the the effect of different lining thickness on your your on the behavior blast response behavior of your your tunnel infrastructure so this is first study and uh, very interestingly, as I already discussed, because uh, here, this place here, because of the damage to the lining and the soil uh, is deforming quite in a similar manner for both of the charge waste weight uh, and, and you get almost, almost similar displacement of the soil at the, near to the top ground inside the soil here somewhere. So this is another observation. And then we move towards the, uh, uh, to, uh, we move towards, uh, towards estimating the, um, or observing the damage of the reinforced concrete lining because of different charge weight. So the concrete has been modeled using the concrete damage plasticity model in Abecas, and which is very quite a uh, good model in order to simulate the constitutive behavior of concrete. Uh, and, 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 and you can just, you know, uh, calibrate the model with some already available experimental data in order to quantify um, uh, uh, the performance of the given design parameter or the performance of the design parameter you are using for your simulation. So, so based on our our parameters, we have tried to model the concrete as I already explained, and then try to analyze it different against different blast loading scenarios with by varying the charge weight. So you can see here with 35 kg charge weight located at the center of the tunnel, you, are, you won't get much damage of the tunnel, but there are failure of the concrete you can clearly observe. So when you're reaching this red line, which is showing the damage intensity, which is around 74% damage actually. And, and when you're going towards the green side, your damage intensity is quite quite uh, less here. And then with the, with the blue side, it, it, very very low damage or no damage basically so there is damage of the tunnel lining with 25 kg charge weight but it's it's, it's scatter it's not uniform damage and uh, that's 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 you can only um, witness if you're doing some sort of uh, uh, analysis where you are using or you're simulating the actual blast inside the tunnel if you are using um, the unified pressure based on some pressure time history standards like UFC 340, you will only get the uniform pressure throughout the length of the tunnel. So you cannot be able to simulate this, this kind of behavior of the tunnel lining. And let, have a look very interestingly with 50 kg charge with, of course the damage is more, but if you can see here, it is not giving much damage at the center of location where you actually originally placed your charge weight. It's the damage is uh, shown here near to the boundaries and could be having some boundary effect, but again, the damage is scattered here. And then with the 100 kg charge, you see more red lines, more damage of the tunnel lining, especially near to the boundary. So you can say there is some boundary effect 
because of uh, the 20 meter domain, but still the result shows that uh, you may or may not be able to see very huge damage near to the crown where you just put the charge weight, which is surprisingly very, very uh, different than the ideology, which says you'll get more, more, more damage to the tunnel where the explosion happened. So, so that's uh, slightly different and more future work uh, is required in this area. So that's what happened. And I think uh, I already shown uh, one video which was showing the explosion, but this video is just showing the deformation of the tunnel. We have taken out the lining and the explosive from the animation. So you can see the deformation of the soil surrounding the tunnel. And that's the effect of the differential strength of the soil. So very interestingly, you get a very, very good behavior or less uh, damage and deformation of the soil, which is having a high shear strength that is quite reasonable and obvious as well. And with the, but the, if you see the friction angle, it means just 10 degree. And uh, 10 degree is not, um, um, uh, so 10 is a good difference actually, but still the damage, if you see here, is almost more than two times than when you're comparing with 35 degree and even with a five degree difference, the damage is very high. So it proves that the strength of the soil actually contribute a lot and meaning even with the marginal difference, the deformation um, of the external infrastructure can change a lot, which impresses again, you know, uh, even though your soil is not having a high share strength, you can do some uh, reinforcement of the soil uh, using soil nailing or maybe some short kit in order to, you know, increase the, um, um, the, the shear strength parameter of the soil. So that is that is one observation and it was really very important. And then uh, that is study, um, we tried to extend it, but in now in rock domain and then studies has been, has, has been published in rock mechanics and rock engineering in 2016. So that's the numerical modeling now. So numerical modeling was quite similar to what I already shown you. This is the tunnel domain made with uh, Lagrangian rock and Lagrangian reinforced concrete lining, which is having 20 meter length, 25 meter breadth and 25 meter depth. Very interestingly, when we were doing some trial analysis, what we have observed was higher penetration of the shock wave um, or the dilation stress wave in the rock domain. And because of that, uh, we have to come up with some um, some you know larger domain size, size basically in order to avoid the reflection of the shock wave. Uh, despite of this, this, uh, this uh, increasing the uh, domain size, we were getting some reflection of the shock wave. But uh, you know the, because the compression cost of such an asset is quite high, so you have to be rational. Like how much, how much difference in results you think are acceptable or not? Okay, so we come up with this this kind of uh, geometry of the. Uh, tunnel domain and with having a symmetrical boundary condition front end the board back end and the symmetry and both the sides and the fixity at the base now now I already discussed uh, all those those um, uh, language engine modeling of reinforced concrete lining uh, uh, and and the details of the reinforcement so three different rock uh, um, with different weathering condition so the first rock, this is the constitutive behavior of the rock um, when they are subject to 500 kPa confinement. Um, and uh, if you can see here, the R3 rock, which is actually highly weathered and showing the least strength compared to other two rocks. So R1 is the least weathered rock with having uh, the maximum RMR rock mass rating value. R2 uh, rock is having the moderately or slightly weathered rock. And then RT is highly weathered with the lowest RMR values. And this is a result here. So very interestingly, if you can see here, the, the reinforcement concrete lining, uh, and this is the time history of the displacement of reinforced concrete lining. Uh, and the result has been extracted at this location in the crown. So, so very interestingly, what we have observed was the reinforced concrete lining, which is having, having a, uh, maximum weathering, uh, heavily weathered rock, basically uh, uh, showing the least displacement compared to other two. And uh, one region of this was uh, maybe because of different uh, damage of the tunnel lining here. Uh, there was another uh, region of uh, this behavior, which we observed and reported in the paper was uh, 
because of uh, the higher stiffness of R1 and R2 compared to compared to R3, what what was happened was uh, the rock was intact despite of the high pressure wave, and the intensity of the shock it actually reflected back towards the lining and make the more damage of the lining in both the cases. But, but in the case of highly weathered rock, what happened was because of the shock wave, it just penetrated from the lining towards the rock and then rock started getting deformed. And because of that, you have attenuation of the shock wave where because of the deformation, your shock wave intensity reduce a lot and this could be a reason you're getting lesser displacement in the case of higher weather rock compared to these two. So the myth was if you are having intact rock, having high strength, you'll get lesser deformation. Could not be always true. That was the interesting observation. And then this is the displacement in the rock. So has been extracted along the crown again. And then and then because of higher displacement should be observed by the least uh, least uh, sorry, the maximum uh, rock with uh, highly weathered rock, basically. So that's, that was quite obvious. And this is the deformation. So R3 rock is showing you the higher deformation of the tunnel. Um, 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 uh, and then R1 and R3 rock uh, are not showing much deformation, but very interestingly, because of the R1 rock was quite intact and then having high strength. So because of that, your suction is starting you know, deforming the rock in a different manner. Then you compare it to, with, with these two responses, the deformation pattern here is very, very different. So, so this was also one important observation um, we made in this study. Now, in the case of rock, uh, the, the velocity of the shock is also really very important. And we would try to, we, we, we actually tried to understand the, uh, the velocity of the shock wave uh, from crown to the ground here, how it will travel. And then what we have observed in case of uh, very, very least weather rock because of the uh, less damage of the rock and and uh, and, and it's having high intact actually, um, high strength. So the shock wave also travel to the grounds, get high ground vibration. So if you are trying to construct a metro here and you are having very high intact rock, so there is very high probability if there is any blast happen it, the shock wave will surely reach at the ground and, and, and the intensity is also quite high. So these structures which, who are resting above the ground here would be subjected to a very slightly, um, or very, for very, very, very low intensity or maybe depending on the charge with a high in, in, incentivity, in, 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 incentivity, sorry, <laughs> intensity um, uh, motion. So I'm also not a native English speaker, that's the region. Okay, so what we have observed here, uh, uh, so this is already, I have discussed about all those things here, like less weather low shows high rock deformation when moving from tunnel ground to ground. And in case of RC lining with less weather low show lesser displacement, but it again, it depends on, on, on what, where you are looking at the results. So that's not a very solid statement here actually. Okay, now the third study, and uh, which is actually we did uh, with, uh, with 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 three fine alignment modeling of um, uh, for understanding the behavior of uh, tunnel which is in curvature. So so what we did in this study, we made a, again the Lagrangian domain of the soil, and we tried to insert a, a curved um, reinforced concrete lining. Uh, sorry, it's not actually reinforced. It's just plain concrete lining and uh, uh, with different curvature. So two different uh, lining with different radius of curvature. So one was 30 meter and another was 70 meter. And because of the curvature, we tried to increase the size of the domain as well. Uh, 70 meter, 70 meter and 15 meter. The reason behind this was because you're having this curvature. So if you are reducing the domain size, actually affect the results. And uh, another reason we we afforded more uh, or maybe the uh, larger domain size. It was because of uh, we actually uh, did not consider modeling reinforcement inside the lining, which actually save a lot of time, uh, uh, which is in terms of computation actually. So this is this is one of the region we come up with a higher, um, you know, uh, geometry or the domain for the tunnel fine element model. Okay, so this is the boundary condition here. 
So the, the front and the back side of the tunnel uh, domain were modeled as a symmetrical boundary and the base was fixed here and the same symmetric boundary has been modeled uh, in this end as well. So this is how it looks like when you see back closer and this is the charge width. So this is the curvature in the tunnel. You can see here, very smooth, nice curvature. And then this is the charge width placed at the center of the tunnel, somewhere here maybe, okay? So what we did was this study has been carried out by considering location of the charge width in two different locations. So the first location, the charge width has been placed here somewhere. And the second case, the charge weight was placed somewhere here actually. And I'll just show you the how the charge will explode and then how the charge exploded and then propagated towards the button boundary. So this is the charge which was placed at the center of the tunnel initially. And then it at one millisecond, the, the explosion happened and the charge started propagating towards the tunnel boundary, the 10 millisecond, 20 millisecond, 40 millisecond, and then 60 millisecond. And it won't reach to the boundary because of the, the radius of the curvature was quite large and the charge was 50 kg, but it still it, uh, it made the damage. And because the suction actually played a really very important role because once the shock wave started, you know, um, propagating towards the tunnel boundary side. So it propagating from this side to like this and from this center towards the right side. And then because of that, there is a suction has been created uh, inside the tunnel and you get higher damage. So, so two different lining. So one is 30 meter, one is 70 meter uh, uh, radius of curvature and different different charge width uh, has been considered a different location. So if you see here, this is the centrally placed charge with 30 meter radius of tunnel lining. This is the centrally placed charge for 70 meter radius of tunnel lining, which is this one. And then the same lining 30 meters radius of curvature, but the charge was placed at the quarter half of the tunnel length here. And you can see the displacement control um, of, 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 of this, uh, in the soil and uh, as well as the damage which was occurred in the, in the tunnel lining. And if you can see the, it's completely destroyed uh, and uh, compared to the reinforced concrete lining, which we have uh, just now noticed in rock and soil um, uh, tunnel domains basically you see a higher damage of the reinforced concrete lining uh, there as well, but here is complete damage has been observed just because of, uh, of, of this curvature and having even the 50 kg tunnel, uh, charge weight. And with the same thing here, uh, the intensity could be quite lesser compared to the smaller radius of curvature, but you can see because of this curvature and the suction, the lining was completely destroyed and very interesting results are now coming here. So if you can see here 30 meter radius and actually uh, the charge was placed at the center of the tunnel and with zero millisecond no deformation of the tunnel and 0.3 uh, uh, actually it's different different time domain. i'm really, really sorry i actually forgot to mention the time here so it's okay so if you can see here uh, when the charge is placed at the center at different time you are having some deformation and at the final stage you see the ground heave here which is around 4.6 meter now imagine your house is located at the top of this uh, this tunnel here at the ground somewhere. So what could be, what could happen, you know, because of the explosion. So that, that's really alarming situation, especially where your tunnels are in uh, curvature. And, and this is uh, again, when your charge is placed in, in the quarter half of the tunnel. Run. So at zero time, the charge was here and then propagation of the shock wave started and get higher damage. And, and then at the end of the analysis get 2.32 meter ground heave here when the charge was placed at the quarter tunnel length. And very interestingly, you see the difference between, between these two. And when the charge was placed at the center tunnel length, it was showing 4.6 meter round heave. And when it was placed here, it was like 2.32 because it just attenuated and goes towards the boundary here. So this was an important observation. The study was published at here at Geotechnica. And this is one of the, one of the uh, like, uh, I think this is a, one of the best studies we have made uh, in past almost now eight years, nine years, I think. So, and 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 this is another um, uh, deformation result of the soil when you are having seventy meter radius of curvature here, and the charge is at the center of the tunnel, and you you can see here very very less ground heave compared to these two cases. So because charge is getting more more uh, distance to travel and 
with the radius of curvature was higher, so the section was also lesser compared to these two cases, especially compared to this first case here with less radius of curvature and charge placed at the center. So that was another case in observation. So, uh, so what what we observed based on the blast response of turn and curvature is suction actually really plays important role, especially when you are talking in terms of uh, blast load placed at the curvature or the center of the tunnel. And tunnels are really very, very highly vulnerable to the blast induced damage. And then significant ground heave was also observed. That's what I just talked about in the last slide. And the closing remark. Uh, so turns are highly and really vulnerable to the blast induced loading. See the higher damage of the concrete lining. Ground heave was also observed in the case of cover tunnels. Even the damage of the concrete lining was observed uh, in this tunnel with soil and rock domain. And we have observed that with the shear strength, less lesser shear strength of the soil shows higher deformation of the soil uh, when they are subjected to the blast loading. And then the lining thickness, of course, it controls the behavior of or damage to the tunnel lining, but the damage is not uh, constant, it's scattered actually, and uh, more research is required in this area. And the deformation of the rock, it actually depends on the, the weathering condition of the rock and the, what was the, was, was the charge which you have placed here. That's it. So I think we, was, I, I actually took more time. So let's have a five minute break and then we can meet again at uh, 2.34 or sorry, I don't know what's time there, but maybe after four, five minutes there. So, so I will start the second part and I'm also online. So if you want to interact with me, have any question, you can just, you know, unmute yourself or write something in chat. I will try to respond. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, it's, uh, it's a wonderful, uh, you know, interaction. And uh, to all the participants, I unmute, I just gave you the uh, freedom to unmute yourself and uh, write your queries in chat box also. So if you have any interaction, uh, want to have any query or question, uh, so you can interact with you, it, sir. So, sir, just one. I want to ask myself one thing because I'm uh, also a structural engineer. It's like did masters in uh, this, and my PhD is also there in the earthquake designing. So, I think the next portion is going to be a really good for my personal, uh, you know, knowledge. Uh, so, as you had, uh, you know, uh, went through the tunnel designing and also which software applications you are actually doing there for uh, doing these analysis. So for dynamic analysis, I think you need to get some uh, really very sophisticated and advanced fine alignment models. So in our case, we have used Abacus a lot, uh, mm -hmm. but along with Abacus, if, if, if things are straightforward, uh, it takes time even, and, and when the things are really not straightforward, right, right now what we are trying to do is we're trying to model um, degree of saturation in soil and trying to model the liquefaction using Abacus. That's, that's really very complicated. And, uh, and in the dynamic situation, because he's not able to handle those high thought of um, the, you know, constitutive behavior when it's, uh, the soil is saturated. So you need to come up with some, you know, compilers to try to write a program in some other platform and then compile it with Abacus in order to come up with the limitations of the Abacus. But in this case for the blast, we have used Abacus, but with the couple already in Lagrangian, which was really very complicated. And I already discussed during the presentation, it took around one year just to get the problem validated and uh, in order to learn the problem, uh, how to model it. So Abacus was the choice for this analysis for all these papers. Okay, so I think uh, we'll wait for it's 10, uh, 2, so we'll wait for like two, three minutes and then uh, you can continue sir, on the next part of the presentation. Okay. So we have 45 people, no one is speaking. Why? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I don't know. I I actually, uh, you know, as a uh, you know protocol, I just uh, you know uh, didn't give them right to unmute themselves. But uh, uh, you know, after you said, I just uh, give them right to unmute themselves. So I think they should uh, have any kind of a query. So they should ask somehow because uh, uh, most of them are actually being from a civil engineering background. I have friends there. I think up top. Yes. Shabish yes. Solanki. Uh, and let me just have a look. <laughs> At least these two people should ask something. <laughs> Nupur Verma, yes. I don't know. Nupur Verma is the same Nupur Verma I know. Yeah, yeah, she she is the same one, sir. <laughs> That's it, three people only. Hello. They don't want to Hi. talk to Hello. me. Hello. Aftab sir is there. You can have an interaction with uh, Yaman sir, can you please uh, switch on my camera also? Uh, so okay, okay, sir. Uh, okay. Now you can do that, sir. Uh, Hello, Roy sir. How are you? Aftab ji, how are you? Don't call me, sir. Come on. <laughs> Actually, uh, actually, yesterday when I was making the feedback form, I just see that uh, a lecture by the Dr. Rohit Yari. I'm very surprised. Uh, oh, it's my friend Rohit. <laughs> so I'm also surprised, actually. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. So how are you good? I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Great. Okay. So are you in Manarachna? I'm still here. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Good, 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 good to talk to you. I can't even see you still. I don't know why. Uh, just now, can you see me now? I think I think I think it's because I'm sharing my screen. So now it's fine, sir. I think now you can see him. I cannot. I can just see my myself. <laughs> no, no. You just pin my uh, pin my name, then you can see me. I don't know why. I think it's just because of the pin, maybe. Yes, I can see you. Come on. You are like me. I huh? no hair. Great. <laughs> yeah. Good to see you after a long time. Come on. Great. Okay. So I think I should continue with the talk now and we'll talk to you later on then. Great. So let me just quickly share my screen. I don't know whether. Okay. So can you see my screen, Yaman? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So this is the second half of the uh, talk today. And then here I'm trying to uh, discuss a very important topic, which is uh, we are working at this um, nowadays, actually. Um, so I started working in this area from 2016 during my PhD at the University of Melbourne. And and this is really very interesting area, especially Indian perspective and uh, Australian perspective, where your retaining walls are actually uh, performing really uh, not good. Excuse me, um, subjected to when they are subjected to earthquake loading. And uh, the earth retaining structures, they are very, really important part for any metro rail infrastructure, even the metro cities, the smart cities, because the earth retaining structures are the structures which are completely. Um, retaining the massive weight behind them. So it could be a basement wall of a building. It could be a you know um, uh, earth retaining wall in a in a harbor area, or could be a bridge abutment, or simple retaining wall which is supporting a highway. And you can see nowadays lots of news are coming, and I'm really very keen to work with uh, Indian government in this area nowadays, uh, trying to establish uh, uh, this um, performance based design for understanding the performance of earth retaining structures when subjected to this kind of extreme loading condition. So, so we are trying to write one proposal nowadays with the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and IIT Madras, and University of Melbourne, and University of New South Wales. So coming, coming up with a team with Austrian Indian researchers in order to come up with some you know, robust design for understanding and the designing of, uh, of, um, of uh, earth retaining structures subjected to um, earthquake loadings.
basically. So let's just start to talk and um, uh, people who are not familiar with arthritic training structures. So there could be an inner form of a cantilever retaining wall here, which is retaining the soil behind it. And there it can be a house or could be a highway like this. So this is the retaining wall supporting this highway here and could be a bridge abutment here. So you are having abutment, which is supporting the approach. And then you are just driving in the approach and trying to reach to the bridge and cross the valley river or um, maybe a um, city highway road. Uh, this is again the diaphragm wall, which is uh, uh, in a building basement and it's retaining the earth surrounding this and it could be any maybe. So in Melbourne, where I was before then Sydney, uh, we are having maybe 80, 80 or 90 floor buildings, uh, maybe one meter away from this basement. It was quite um, terrific design actually. And they are making a straight cut in the soil, maybe 30 meters down the you know ground. So it was really very important in order to you know understand. Uh, we have to understand the performance of these kind of structures because if the something happened to this wall, the whole building will go down and could be catastrophic in terms of economy and human life. So so now this is a quay wall, you know, harbor structure, and then they, you are having this earth retaining structures. And this is very hot topic nowadays of the research because you are having a retaining wall which is supported on the pile foundation, which is socketed inside the rock here. So you are having a rock, maybe 20, 10, 15, whatever. Uh, is could be the number and then you're having a rock and then you just put your piles socket inside the rock and then your arthritis structure is there uh, uh, trying to retain the soil here and there is a metro rail going on so uh, it emphasizes actually the importance of such a structure and their uh, satisfactory performance during uh, an earthquake okay now this is uh, some unfortunate incident happened. So it was in Gate Kanto earthquake in Japan, I think in 2023 maybe. And you can see the deformation and air damage of the retaining wall and the complete collapse because of the excessive pore pressure generated during the earthquake and then sliding and rotation of the wall, it completely destroyed. So this was the uh, Japan uh, Kanto earthquake. And then again, because of uh, higher rotation displacement. So this is a bridge abutment and you can see that the gap between the the wing wall of the uh, uh, bridge and then uh, abutment or and, and 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 the ground and then you can see the rotation so because of the rotation and displacement there was a gap created and the settlement of the ground was also responsible for this and because of this all those things come together your girders were unseated from the deck and then collapsed and the whole bridge uh, was actually collapsed and this was from the Butch earthquake in 2001 in india um, so it was the research by University of Oxford researchers and that they have got some um, some satellite images of a sheet pile wall here. And then you can see that because of the liquefaction, there was a huge settlement and the damage of this sheet pile wall in, in, during the Butch Indian earthquake in 2001. So first of all, you need to understand that in order to come up with a safe design criteria for this kind of earth retaining structure when subjected to the seismic loading condition, uh, what kind of loadings you are considering on what kind of loading selecting on these structures. So at normal state and in bachelor's course, we are teaching this to the students. So in the orthogenic structures, you are having a soil here. And then because of the gravity, you are having the sulfate of the soil, which is retained by this wall. And it is also having his own sulfate. And this is the geometry of the retaining wall. And in static nature, you assume the static variation of the earth pressure literally, uh, which is a triangular distribution, which acts at the height of one by three of the wall height. And then you can calculate the earth thrust and then can find out the factor of safety or in terms of overturning and sliding and try to design the structure. That's the basic static design. But what's the difference between the static case and uh, earthquake case? So in case of earthquake, you are having a uh, literal thrust also acting from the soil toward the wall and the you know because of the inertia of the wall you are also having the other component which is coming from the sulfate of the retaining wall so this is your earthquake case and in this case with uh, when you compare it with the static case where you are having the seismic pressure which is triangularly distributed uh, but now it's more because of this additional thrust starts acting from the retaining wall from the vacuum soil to the retaining wall so this cannot be, actually, this should not be idealized as triangular case, but because uh, we don't have much guidelines available, what could be the shape of this dynamic pressure? People started utilizing the old theory and which came from these two great people from Japan, 
Mononobe and Okabe, and they come up with this theory, which is we call Mononobe Okabe theory. And the equation has been proposed in 1929. And based on that, it is a modified version of the Coulomb theory, and you can get additional increased earth pressure, and then you assume it as, as a static triangular variation of the pressure, which acts at a height of one by two to the wall uh, height, actually, and then apply, and then get the new factor of safety for overturning and sliding. But the case was actually, um, 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 as I already told you, the people have find out during the earthquake, this pressure is not linear, it's non-linear. And if you are going with this design, you have to assume throughout the life of the structure, this additional pressure is acting, but this structure may not see a single earthquake in its design life. So what's the point considering this additional earth pressure in the structure? And even though there is an earthquake, so if you can see the thrust will come only for a few seconds. Uh, so, so whether it's reliable or not to design your structure with this increased massive earth pressure loading or not, that is a debate, uh, actually this is a point of debate and, and we're trying to understand the behavior of, uh, of earth restraining structures when they are subjected to, 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 to dynamic loading condition in a timely manner. So what's the time duration of the pressure, whether it's important or not. So, so what we try to do is, first of all, you need to understand the failure mechanism. So it can be failed by, failed by sliding, can be failed by rotation. And because of that, you can have active failure pitch uh, formation behind the retaining wall and uh, you can get settlement of the wall and then structure may fail. So what we tried to do was we tried to understand first the behavior of the structure under um, different pulses, uh, how they are behaving and what's the displacement you can get, you can get with based on different pulses. So, but how you test it, that is a problem because the earth retaining structure is quite massive. So how you can apply earthquake loading in a very big structure, uh, that was a point of debate. And then we tried to, you know, uh, do some similitude analysis uh, and uh, we have figured out uh, some you know scale down model uh, dimension. So in order to do uh, testing, uh, we have to come up with a scale down model because this is our uh, this is the shake table of University of Melbourne. Um, this is a two meter by two meter shake table, and we also have in our lab here at University of New South Wales, which is one point five meter by one point five meter. But that is that table is really very powerful because this table can only simulate uh, a stroke in two dimension. So this is your east weight, west actuator, and north south actuator. So you can have thrust uh, in horizontal direction only. You can act simultaneously, but only horizontal. But the table we have at University of New South Wales, it has having an actuator which is placed at the base. So you can simulate the vertical ground motion, which is really very important in case of earth retaining structures. But it was from a PC program. So we just tried to stick with the horizontal motion. We have now tried the vertical ground motion and tried to scale down the model, uh, the retaining wall model in order to come up with a you know small retaining wall model, which you can put it on the top of the shake table and test it. So you followed all those theorems here. If you're interested, have a look in them. And then it's really very important and very interesting if you can do such calculation to scale down your, your you know, geotechnical models. Uh, they are having lots of limitations, but if you understand it well, you can overcome some of them and you know get some meaningful result. So this was the assumption of the same material, same acceleration scaling of time in 1G environment because the shake table is in, in the ground. So you have to assume this environment is the 1G environment. But if you're doing the same thing with the centrifuge, you can control the acceleration here and you can, you can get rid of some of the limitations, which are really very you know, difficult to uh, manage in 1G model. But we don't have the centrifuge here and University of Melbourne, only one centrifuge in Australia. And then I, th I think in one in India, uh, which is I think near to IIT Bombay, so, 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 so it's hard to get used, uh, use the centrifuge is costly as well. So what we did was try to scale it down based on one G environment. And then this is the model. So uh, this research has been uh, uh, accepted by uh, the soil dynamics earthquake engineering now. And now uh, what, what we did, we tried to scale down the model. So this, this, this was the structural prototype model. So see the dimension 3.625 meter. It, we design it statically in order to have a safe factor of safety during earthquake loading condition. And then we scale it down by a factor of 10. So this is the new dimension of the 
height, which is 3.625, 2.3625, and the same thing for all other dimensions. So this is a then scaled down model. The assumption was same material, same acceleration, scaling of time. Apply the same properties to scale down properties to the to the backfill, scale down property to the retaining wall, and then compare the result from this full scale and the scale down, and here's the result. So very interestingly, you can see the scale down model can, can replicate the behavior of the full scale prototype model very accurately if the scaling laws ha 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 have been followed properly. Uh, but the thing is, you cannot get the same response because the scale down model will not show you the same displacement uh, because it will show you the displacement which is scaled down. So you need to increase or you need to scale up the result file in order to compare with the full scale one. Okay, so when you do that, you'll get this match. So this is the theory behind the scaled on modeling, and it's really interesting. So so we 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 come up uh, with 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 a solution that that actually uh, allow us to model uh, the seismic behavior of orthogenic structures using scaled down models. But the problem was when you do the, do the similitude analysis. Uh, so this study we have con conducted in fine elements of Terabakers. So finite element software, you can assign any property. You can assign unit weight to this wall, maybe around 100,000 kg per meter cube. It will work. But what happened in the real life, in the lab, you can't do that. So this is a problem. So with you assign the proper scaling down property, you need a very high unit weight of the scaled down wall. And if you do that, you can get the match. But in the life, real life, in the lab, you can't do that. So you have to do some assumption. And what we come up with, the assumption was uh, in the lab that the earth retain structures are really very massive. And when they fail, is the failure is not actually happening to the structure element. It happens because of the additional or excessive rotation and displacement to the structure, not because of the failure of the concrete or the reinforcement. Because if you have a, have a higher deformation and displacement rotation of the retaining wall, the soil behind it will fail. So the overall structure is already fair. You don't need to wait for the uh, seeing the crack in the wall or you know failure of the reinforcement inside the wall. Uh, the structure is already failed without a single crack because it's displaced and rotate um, because of the excessive earthquake loading. So you can relax with this higher um, you know uh, intensity um, or higher value of unit weight. What you can do is you can just simply um, uh, put, put the model based on the elastic uh, stiffness similitude criteria and try to come up with a model which can satisfy the similitude laws, okay? Um, but no, not with the same material. That will also show you the correct result. And we try to do that, got the good match. And then based on that, we try to change the material of the wall. So our material of the wall was polycarbonate material. And this is the polycarbonate retaining wall material. So this is the polycarbonate. We just cut it and glued it together and tried to do the testing based on this. We get the fine element result for this kind of material. And it was very quite near to the uh, scale down. So scale down stiffness of the concrete is around. Um, so actually fully scale stiffness of the concrete, if you say it could be around, uh, let's say uh, M20, M25, you can just figure it out with 5,000 root FCK in Indian, I think, and then 5,500 root FCK in Australian standard. And then you can do the same thing at, uh, divided by 10 and find out which material is suited for this. So based on the elastic stiffness scaling down, we found out the polycarbonate material is very near to the scale down stiffness and try to model the wall based on that. And then this is the, uh, we just installed some or glued some uh, sandpaper uh, behind the back of the wall in order to initiate the friction between the particle and the wall. So this is one model. And then before using this model, what we tried to do, we started using the distorted model as well. So it, the good form with the distorted model, you don't need to do the symmetric cal calculation, but it can also show you a good result because if you are more interested just to see the deflection of the wall and then try to understand the dynamic properties of the backfill. So this study can give you a really, very good uh, response actually. So let's see what happened with the scaled down model now. So first of all, the construction of the model. So this was the model, it was 1.72 meter long. We installed some uh, high density form in order to minimize the shock wave reflection when you are doing the testing because of the scale down, there will be reflection, whatever you do, but you're just trying to minimize it so that the, the impact of this reflection coming from the back towards the wall will be minimized and it won't reflect a lot and your results are you know, having a good accuracy. 
and then try to find out the maximum dry density of the, the soil. So in our case, we just try to get rid from, from uh, using a sand or any clay material because constructing a scale down backfill using this kind of uh, uh, you know fine grain material is really very hard you have to come up with sand draining devices or some other sophisticated method uh, and most of the time you won't match the field density so this was this was the problem and that's why we started using this crushed rock uh, and most of the time in the retaining wall scenario it is advised to fill up the backfill using this uh, granular materials because they are having excellent drainage and then you can drain out the pore pressure or pore water pressure or uh, pore water very easily. And then try to find out the maximum dry density of uh, compacted uh, of, of this uh, crushed rock and then try to place it, use the vibration to label it. And at the end, uh, you make one layer, two layer, three layer based on the control density calculations and you come up with this model. So this is the final model. And this is the instrumental setup. So three, uh, four different laser transducers. So these are the laser transducers we have placed with in the different height of the retaining wall, trying to read the displacement of this retaining wall, different accelerometers inserted inside the wall. So these are the different accelerometers inside the wall and uh, in the material and uh, sorry, in the soil. And then one accelerometer, which is triaxial accelerometer, which can read acceleration in three dimension which was installed to see the reflection, how much reflection is coming from. It was installed at the back face, in the middle of the soil height. And these are the accelerometers. So the uniaxial accelerometer, very costly, but it was really very accurate, very cheap, not very accurate, but this one was okay. This one was good actually. So this is track selection accelerometers. So install all these things inside the soil based on their accuracy level and desired location. And these are later transition, this costly around maybe uh, 1500 2000 dollars every single transducer that was placed here so this is the laser transducer the accuracy was really very good for 200 millimeter the accuracy could be around 0 0.02 millimeter in the dynamic condition when the wall is moving so quite good accuracy actually so now the thing is you already made the model how you will test it how you get this dynamic property of this model uh, so what we come up with one solution so do some dynamic uh, Pulse testing and uh, some testing with the actual earthquake. Okay, so let's see the first the free vibration response analysis. So we apply some plug test uh, at the base of the model. So when I'm saying plug test, what does it mean is you are actually giving a very high velocity pulse. Uh, you're applying a very high velocity pulse at the base of the model and then uh, just stop. Okay, so this is a very high pulse velocity pulse. If you can see is reaching from zero to one of these numbers. So let's say 50 millimeter. So zero to 50 millimeter in just 0 0.125 second. And then you just stop and then it will, you know, um, vibrate freely. And that is the response you need to capture in order to understand the free vibration properties of your retaining wall. And we did this with different, different testing with different, different amplitude and then try to get the results. So I just wanted to show you result of or maybe this is the high definition camera recording. So as soon as wall started moving, you can see the gap between the wall and the soil and the exometers you can see there and then stop. So everything finished in I think less than one second maybe. And then this is the power plug plug test pulse, and then it is the loading phase, the extra accelerometers or the lasers will capture the whole duration, but you don't need this. So you need to take out this from the data. Otherwise you won't get the accurate free vibration response. Uh, take out this data from the recorded measurements and then try to analyze this free vibration phase here and you get this. So when you analyze this free vibration phase based on Fourier transformation or free frequency analysis, uh, so you get the mode shape and the uh, vibration, natural frequency, first mode, second mode of your structure. So this is very stiff structure. And most of the time, if it's a stiff, depending on the ground motion, they are ha having first mode, which is actually dominating there. So you can see a very good sharp first mode B here, uh, it's having high energy as well compared to the second modes. So this is the results of uh, the free vibration response. And these are the displacement of the retaining wall. So relative displacement when the wall is subject to different uh, uh, plug amplitude. And obviously because of the higher 
amplitude of the plug will show you the higher response. Uh, the the small intensity plug is actually uh, generating some sort of non-linear response of the wall. But if you are going towards the higher intensity of the plug, it is actually uh, some sort of curvy linear curvy linear response of the retaining wall was observed in all the tests. So this is the one observation here, and then 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 we tried to do the same thing with um, uh, different uh, multiple pulses. So try to model with the multiple pulses because of the stiffness of the model was quite high. So if you are applying a real earthquake in it, even with the scale down time domain, it won't, it won't show you a desired response. So what we did was try to uh, analyze the model using some intensified pulses. So this is our first pulse and I think three to four hertz frequency. The second pulse three to four hertz frequency with different amplitude or different peak displacement here and then apply this at the base of the model. And this is the result. Very interestingly, we, what we observe both the pulses is actually uh, giving you active state re residual displacement of the retaining wall. So when I'm saying active state residual displacement, what does it mean is this is your retaining wall here. And then when the shape base is shaking using this pulse here, so this pulse is shaking the space and then you're getting higher displacement which with the increasing height of the retaining wall, but it's not going back it means the wall is permanently deformed um, at the end of the result, uh, end of the test, actually. So that's the same thing yeah, observed in the, both the cases, which is active state, which means the wall is moving away from the soil. So that's the response. And this is the response we have observed from the exometers. So exometer was placed at the base, middle height of the backfill, and the top height of the backfill. And you can see the in amplification of the acceleration when you're going from base to the top. That's really very really important because, uh, because amplification actually is the factor which is responsible for higher deformation at the top of the retaining wall. And you need to quantify it in, in your design. So I will explain it to you why it's important in our next slides. Actually, this, is, this will come up a few slides. So this is one thing. What else you can estimate uh, from your scale down model? Uh, which you can do use uh, using the shear wave velocity. And I was trying to get this shear wave velocity um, estimation based on some Bender element test. So Bender element tests are quite popular to, uh, you can do a dynamic track cell test as well in order to estimate the shear wave velocity, but the problem is very costly. And then and when I was uh, doing my PhD, uh, we were not having uh, that facility uh, at University of Melbourne. So we contacted some other university and they're asking, they asked around $1,600 for single test and it was quite costly. So we use our brain and try to find out whether we can use our own, you know, resources to find out the shape of velocity of the backfill. And we got the answer because our the accelerometers are really very accurate, uh, at least the uniaxial accelerometers. So what we did is we showed one accelerometer at the base, one accelerometer at the top, and then try to excite the system at the base using the shake table and try to see the difference of the time uh, taken by the wave to travel from top to bottom. So you can just identify this lag here and then find out what's the time difference. You know the height, use this formula to get the shear wave velocity of your elastic soil column. So you're assuming the soil is not going into the plastic phase here. And then based on this, this is the response. So it's quite good. In some places it's not, it's, it's moving uh, a bit, but at least uh, you get a value and you are somewhere near because you have this confidence base of different test data. And this matches with the elastic soil column analysis also. You can get, uh, you can estimate the shear velocity of the column. You know the shear modulus of the soil and the height uh, of the thickness of the layer and the density of the soil. So, so we have a good, good agreement and that study is now um, um, uh, in a final stage with soil dynamics earthquake engineering published in the conferences as well. And uh, so th th that was uh, about uh, the scaled down model and uh, with the dist dist uh, distorted retaining wall model, what properties you can get, what kind of response, what kind of uh, displacement you can get. So th 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 it was all about, uh, about a distorted model. Now, we, 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 after the distorted model, we tried to do the same thing with the polycarbonate sheet. But the problem was the distorted model was the was fixed at the base of the shake table uh, or, or the model base. Here, what kind of boundary condition you're going to use? Uh, because the, the, the walls are not most mostly fixed. Maybe a basement wall could be a fixed boundary condition. But uh, most of the time, the walls are having piles or maybe free, uh, free standing walls or maybe supported on the rock. 
uh, so it's resting over a bedrock. So it's not always fixed actually. So what we tried to uh, come up with uh, some ideas in order to model the, the connection of this retaining wall with the shake table base. And then we try to model it using a pile, but how you model actual physical pile in a shake table and which follow the scaling down criteria, that is quite complicated. So we try to come up with uh, uh, finding some, some, some uh, material which can, or finding some, some small structural component which can simulate the behavior of the pile. So in case of, uh, so we consider the rock socket piles because it's the simplest way you can model the deformation or the deflection behavior of the pile. If it's a free standing pile or any other pile, it could be complicated. People who don't know what is a pile, so piles are actually, you are having a vertical cylindrical elements made from concrete steel basically, or sometimes woods as well. And you just insert it in the ground, which is having a low draining capacity strata. And uh, it could be freestanding, which is just not supporting by anything, just supporting by the friction of the soil. It could be uh, end bearing uh, when you're supporting using the rock, it could be rock socketed when you're just inserting the base of the pile inside the rock. Uh, so what we did, we tried to uh, characterize our pile based on the rock socketed piles and try to figure out the rotational stiffness in the fine element software abacus. Again, so try to model everything. These are the property of the fine element model. The boundaries were modeled using the viscous boundaries so that in order to minimize the reflection from the boundaries and then try to find out the rotational here and the rotation based on these, these and this, so this is the destabilizing moment. This is the destabilizing moment, and this will give you the stability. So based on everything, you just sum up with the moment, uh, which are destabilizing and stabilizing moment, and then uh, uh, then try to find out, uh, um, uh, try to find out the rotational behavior. So this is also sorry destabilizing. This is the stabilizing moment here. So try to find out the rotational stiffness of these piles, and based on that. Uh, use the similitude analysis to in order to find the rotational stiffness of the scale down piles. And based on the rotational stiffness of the scale down piles, you find that the new material. So we have actually manufactured these small springs here in order to give you the same rotational stiffness, which can come up with the scale down analysis. And then based on that, we, we placed this at the base of the find, uh, sorry, scale down model in the lab. And we also did the fine element investigation with the, considering the full rock socketed pile and with the with the scaled out spring. So fine element model with the rock socketed pile and the fine element model, uh, which is supported using these springs here. And you can see the response during an earthquake and quite very good agreement actually we have also. There's some deviation here, but you, you can imagine this is a fully scaled 20 meter long pile. This is a very tiny spring and it's very scaled, a small scale and 0.4 meter long model. So quite very good agreement actually has been observed between the results. And this is the construction of the model. So you have to make the free rotation. So there is like no connection between this spring and there is a central rod here of the iron. So we just try to cover up with uh, small poly, the PVC pipes actually, in order to make the free rotation of these springs actually. So this is the final model. Same terminology has been used uh, for backfill construction behind the scale down retaining wall and the same extra, extra meters, everything was installed similar to the distorted model. I have already explained. And now if you can see here, this is your scale down model with all the instruments inside it and lasers, accelerometers, and the strings at the base. So let's see the result. Similar to the distorted wall, we have done different testing with different different pulses. This time we go with a little, little bit high intensity pulses, uh, starting from 0.08G to 0.8G. And then based on that, we, we this is the response, get higher displacement when you're going from base to top, that's quite obvious. But again, the active state displacement and the rotation of the retaining wall has been observed in all the analysis with increasing peak ground acceleration. Okay. So this is a displacement profile. So quite a good agreement linear displacement profile has been observed uh, with increasing intensity of the ground motion. But there in one case with 0.7G, we are not getting linear profile. It quite be because of there could be some gap has been formed during the experimentation uh, of the pulses. But uh, most of other cases, they have shown quite good linear displacement profile. So let's see the rotation of the wall, if they can rotate or not. So this is the top view. And this is the elevation front view, not front view, elevated view, which is from the side, we made a window. This is your retaining wall here somewhere. So the retaining wall is somewhere here. This is your retaining wall here, and then it's moving. So you can see when they started more 
excitation at the base. You can see a gap and the rotation of the retaining wall. And the same rotation you can observe here also. If you can concentrate here, the rotation you can easily observe in the backfill and in the retaining wall. So this was another observation we have made based on it. And then once you finished all the lab investigation, we tried to come up with a robust numerical model of whether our numerical model can replicate the behavior of the arthritis structures or not. Uh, and so you need to first of all, find out the constitutive relation of the backfill. So this was, uh, 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 we did different geotechnical investigation in order to characterize the backfill um, and then try to find out the uh, modulus of the backfill in a confined environment, which is the case of the retaining wall, basically. And then did the, the different, different types of loading condition with increased uh, uh, st stress level, depending on the stress level in the field we consider. And even with the low stress level, somewhere here, because of the uh, scale down model is subjected to a low stress condition. And then come up with this finite element model of the scaled down model. And this is the property of the finite element model here. And this is the Ducker Prager model we have used here. And Ducker Prager model, oh no, sorry, we have used in this is the Mohorkula model actually. Uh, uh, Ducker Prager model was used in the tunnel blast loading scenarios, uh, which is which because of it can simulate the strain rate effect in the uh, in the material. But in this study, we have used Mohorkula model. And very interestingly, uh, the Mohorkula model has been calibrated because the Mohorkula model can uh, give you uh, the yielding, the failure of the soil but how you will get the constitutive behavior, which is actually coming after the soil is failed. So we have modeled this behavior with extension provided in the Mohorkula model, and we can model the hardening, softening of the Mohorkula model using, using the track surface data in order to teach it how to replicate the realistic and accurate behavior of the backfill. And this is the uh, curve. You have to put input based on your calibration tissel test results. And this is the input for the Mohorkula model, like an extension. And then based on that, the Mohorkula model can accurately simulate the post chill behavior of the soil accurately. So this is the result. And this is the Mohorkula model in the lab. This is the Mohorkula based on one element test in Abacus. And you can see the good agreement between these two. And then modeling the damping. So people are from mechanical geo and geotechnical and structural background. They're more familiar with this damping. This is the property of, uh, of mitigation of the vibration uh, along with the time actually. So damping is a natural property of any structural material. And then you, you have to come up with this some damping value when you are trying to do some non-analysis. But in case of soil, it's really, really hard to accurately model the damping of the soil. And we have tried to come up with some reasonable agreement with available literature data uh, from USETIC and Debris and uh, our damping proposal, our damping modeling proposal, uh, our proposed model is quite, quite really good. Uh, uh, was doing quite good compared to the, the results proposed by this view setting and every uh, debris basically so so we, we 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 are quite confident in our damping model of the soil as well and based on that uh, we developed the fine element model so backfill was simulated again with the calibrated molecular model as i told you different pulses like similar thing which we have applied in the shake table experiment uh, applied in the model base of the fine element model okay so then compare the result between the shake table and the fine element and this is the result with the different pulses we have observed in the shake table experiment actual testing and based on the the fine table model so the comparison has been made and it was observed that the shape the fine table simulation uh, uh the accurate and the reliable fine table model can can actually replicate the seismic performance of our structures uh, quite well so this is the result and i think we are run out of time so what i do is I will just skip this study and then quickly go to this space. So this place, actually, what we have tried to do, we try to model a actual full fully scale retaining wall and uh, try to analyze with different uh, big ground acceleration. And this is a time history analysis based on different different ground excitation. So this is artificial exogram. This is natural exogram based on the peer data. And then we try to analyze the earth pressure behind the retaining wall. And we have also nonlinear dynamic pressure behind the retaining wall with the increasing height. And if we have discussed, uh, I have already discussed this uh, actually during the starting of the lecture with the mono copy method, you get the linear pressure, which cannot accurately replicate the behavior. In some places it can overestimate. And in some cases, this uh, static method can, or the pseudo static method can, can overestimate the seismic pressure behind the retaining wall. 
And very interestingly, we have observed the residual pressure behind the retaining wall after the earthquake, uh, which actually proves the, the yielding of the soil or the generation of the active residual bridge behind the retaining wall. So I think I should not discuss these things. At the end, we just tried to model one displacement-based model in order to uh, estimate the seismic displacement of the retaining wall. And this is the methodology. I think uh, it's going to publish very soon and uh, it's in communication with one journal right now and published actually already in one conference and my thesis. So, so, so this is the proposed model uh, which we made to in order to predict the or estimate the seismic displacement of the retaining walls when uh, when they are having fixity at the base. So this is the hand calculation which we have proposed simplified hand calculation and that's the result from the shake table experiment. So both are showing good agreement and then this model uh, is actually uh, proved its uh, you know uh, accuracy in order to model or in order to estimate the seismic displacement of retaining walls. So this is all about. I think I'm so sorry I ran off of the time. So we don't want to discuss much. Uh, just show you the conclusion. So the base resin and retaining wall, backfill soil inertia really plays a really very important role in order to, uh, uh, for, for, for actually the seismic performance of the retaining wall and the active state displacement of the retaining wall observed during all the cases, uh, which means the soil, what retaining wall is moving away from the soil. And we have also observed the amplification of the horizontal acceleration and which was not constant with the applied ground acceleration. And then the uh, rotational base polycarbonate retaining wall, so linear displacement and non-linear displacement, we, which we have already discussed. Uh, soil water separation is quite common, and this raises alarm because of this separation, the peak pressure should reduce because there is no contact between the soil and the retaining wall, so you should have lesser peak pressure. Okay, so I'm not going to discuss much. I think I should open the form, like platform now for the discussion. Uh, thank you so much for giving me opportunity to talk. And uh, and uh, I really wanted to thank Dr. Sunita, who's really a very close friend of mine. Uh, she contacted me uh, for this. And um, thank you, Dr. Sunita, for, for, for providing me this opportunity. And uh, thanks everyone. You were a really, very wonderful audience. And please, please ask something if you have, if you, if you uh, let me know if you want. To discuss anything my email id is here so just send me an email and we can discuss further thank you so much okay thank you so much sir uh, it's indeed and a very informative and well uh, you know uh, balanced uh, session as you said in the early you know beginning that the session is going to divide into two uh, basic uh, sectors so I think uh, all of uh, the sessions, uh, you know, the topics that you have chosen, either for the moderate loading of earthquakes or the high uh, loading of the blast uh, uh, or explosion. So um, it's a really an, an actually an honor, a very intense and deep research you have done in the past few years. <laughs> so for us as a beginner, it's a, it's a very, uh, you know, path uh, following uh, techniques. So I, I think, yes. And uh, uh, I would like, uh, you know, all the participants who are having any kind of a query to Rohit sir. Uh, so just uh, one more thing, you can uh, write your uh, email ID and the chat box so that if anyone wants to connect with you later on or have any kind of a queries later, so they can, uh, you know, uh, follow you. Okay. okay, my email ID is in the chat now. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So uh, thank you. And uh, I have, uh, you know, open all the mics. Uh, so if anyone wants to uh, interact with sir, um, they are, uh, you know, happy to welcome. We are all happy to welcome you there. So anyone? So you can also, you know, connect with your old colleagues. <laughs> you want to yeah, I will you. ask questions now. <laughs> sir, how are you? Hi, Chavi. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. It was a great session. <laughs> And I have done so such a quality work in a long time. I have attended your complete session, but due to some Thank network you. issue, because I'm in Jaipur, I'm not in Faridabad, so I was not able to uh, connect yourself. Yeah, that's completely fine, Chavi. Thank you so much for attending the session, and I hope you are good. You know, it is good. How's baby? Yeah, he is good. <laughs> Come in Great. Jaipur. <laughs> Yeah, I will definitely visit Jaipur this time, you know. Let let the flies open first. <laughs> You're looking like an Australian man. I'm looking like an old man nowadays. <laughs> but it was a great session. I enjoyed your session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, hope, hope 
you are good take care of yourself and i don't know why chavi chavi is there okay uh, what nupur nupur is not speaking anything she's so shy i think <laughs> and, <laughs> and what about uh, anjali ma'am anjali ma'am is there i think organizer is not there sunita so, ma'am she just left actually this is like actually they don't need to stay na so <laughs> big fellows <laughs> you know so, actually we are on the end, last day right and it's uh, we are just winding up each and everything so maybe she is i don't know i will call her wait because she has to be there <laughs> i'm just just uh, you know call cool i think other than us i think no one is here uh, aftab yes, aftab you still here maybe she is ab ab i was in i'm still here i'm listening to you i'm sorry <laughs> how are you aftab sir i'm fine fine sir i'm still there sir. so aftab ji kaisa chal raha hai aajkal सिर्फ कुछ ही लोग बच्चे सब इधर इधर हो गए तो आप जयपुर में पढ़ा रहे हो अभी यस आई मीन जे सी आर सी यूनिवर्सिटी अरे वो अरे आगे आगे आपका ये ऑर्गेनाइजर आ गए भाई वेटिंग रूम में लेकिन लेट मी एडमिट है सुनीता मैम शी इज ऑन माइक इज यस थैंक यू सुनीता मैम अंजलि मैम अंजलि मैम इज नॉट देयर सुनीता मैम इज देयर सुनीता मैम यस यस आई एम हियर वेरी मच हियर Uh, no no you are not here you just joined i think <laughs> <laughs> i'm just saying i'm so sorry no, i was i was i was i was talking to these guys like it's maybe the hodis they don't need to be present in the session <laughs> no big no, fellows no. <laughs> no no the loss is totally mine to i got disconnected <laughs> no it was good actually you were not there you know once i was presenting in uh, this uh, svnit surat i think and there was like a director uh, was there so before my talk he was talking and then when he finished they introduced me and then they they told him like organizers sir you know you can go it's okay no, no i want to listen to rohit for 10 minutes and i was this horrified like oh, oh my god <laughs> No, no Rohit. <laughs> We are so so proud of you, Rohit. Um, and it was such a wonderful session. And the research that you have conducted is actually mind-boggling, mind-boggling research. We cannot ask for more. And I don't think anybody else who's uh, has got such an exposure on blast research. Response and blast resistant design and earth retaining structures. It is, uh, it is just you know eye opening and an enlightenment uh, for all of us. Uh, no wonder that uh, you are in Australia and uh, doing such good work. Uh, no wonder. <laughs> and just, rohit just, we are we will always be indebted to you for uh, agreeing to this and spending time with us and presenting such a comprehensive presentation and your little animations in between they were uh, you know they actually drove the concept home uh, it is really very nice very well made presentation and very well made animations uh, thank rohit thank you ma'am thank you so much thank you so much and you've done more much more justice than was required to the objectives of our fgp thank you so much madam and thank yeah hope to so hope much. to yeah i will be in touch and i think i should leave now because uh, there is one more meeting in 8 uh, minutes and i have to take my lunch actually it's around 3:30 here okay okay, <laughs> okay 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 please please and thank you so much rohit the department is totally honored by your presence thank you so much yeah uh, me too ma'am thank you so much for for inviting me and everyone take care of yourself and goodbye and bye chavi bye bye yaman and thank you for for hosting the session
थैंक यू बाय थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू मैम ओके बाय बाय okay so the participants uh, as uh, i shared in the morning also that uh, it's a little bit a change uh, in the schedule so at 11:30 we are going to have another session um, it's on the silab uh, most of us uh, i think are new or maybe you know all of uh, you know maybe we are going but it is again a free and open source software for analysis simulation and modeling uh, and the session is going to be delivered by professor dr brijesh kumar he is uh, actually deputed as an associate dean for academics affairs at manurajna india itself and uh, from 2:30 onwards uh, we will be having our valedictory and then feedback and then we'll be having an uh, assessment um, i shared the details of the assessment in the uh, uh, whatsapp but still uh, i will give you a little bit of information um, the assessment is going to be performed on google forms it will be having 50 mcq questions each question is going to carry one mark and as per the aict norms uh, your attendance is it has to be more than 80% and uh, 60% you have to score to get the certificate uh, from the aict of course after uploading uh, the marks and the attendance from our side and um, there is uh, one uh, feedback uh, that you have to give at uh, the atal portal also so unless you are not going to put that feedback you will not be able to uh, you know register or you not be able to get that certificate so it's a request from my side that uh, we will be doing all the formalities of uh, the uh, concluding uh, you know uh, valedictory and uh, uploading the marks and attendances from our side uh it would the earliest and uh, from your end uh, it will be the uh, filling of the feedback form so i think uh, uh, you know it will be uh, done on both ends simultaneously uh, so that you people are not uh, uh, you know going to receive uh, the certificates uh, you know at a sometime delayed time i would have to say so we will have a break for 30 minutes then and we will again join at 11:20 or 25 Uh, for the last session of this fdp on silas uh, sila by professor dr bidesh kumar and if you have any kind of queries uh, the chat box is open uh, the whatsapp uh, uh, group is open that's why we didn't uh, uh, made it for uh, you know for chatting for only by the admins so if you want to have any interaction want to have any uh, want to have any kind of query so you can post it there and there's one query that just, just came up that regarding the uh, sharing of the presentations so um, that uh, will i just uh, already sh uh, share that uh, some of the experts had already given their consent uh, to share the presentation so we will be sharing that presentation with you but uh, some of the people who are uh, having uh, you know having their research uh, or some important uh, uh, data Uh, regarding to the national importance or anything so that's why we are not able to share that uh, data with you so uh, i think i hope you will be understanding that thing. so uh, i think it's uh, it's already 10:56 we will uh, meet at 10 11:25 and uh, see you then have a break and thank you so much for attending the first session of day 5 Uh, okay so a very good morning once again uh, to all the dear participants and uh, now we are in the last session of uh, this uh, online fgp uh, aict sponsored atal online fgp on contemporary advances in sustainable and integrated infrastructure organized by the department of civil engineering apt mriirs So today's uh, last session is uh, going to be again a kind of a we can say that a practical information, and the session is going to delivered by Professor Dr. Bridges Kumar. And uh, Professor Dr. Bridges Kumar is currently deputed as an Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, uh, Manavachna International Institute of Research Studies, India. He did PhD, M Tech, and B Tech from Kurukshetra University. 
He has 24 years of experience in academics. He has published around 65 research papers in reputed international and national journals. He has supervised around 30 MTech theses and nine PhD theses. He had delivered expert talk on various platforms at both national and international levels. Some of his uh, uh, memberships include the fellow and lifetime membership of Institution of Engineers India, Association of Computer Machinery, lifetime membership from Interna Indian Society for Technical Education, lifetime membership from International Association of Engineers, and lifetime membership from Center for Educational Growth and Research. Uh, Professor Dr. Vijesh Kumar, uh, um, am I audible to? Are you here? Yes, very good morning. Yes, you're very much audible. Thank you for a wonderful introduction. Thank you, sir. So, uh, should I share my screen? Uh, yes, sir, you can. Thank you. I hope it, it's visible to everyone. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. it is visible. So we are going to discuss uh, about Scilab. It's a free and open source software. Uh, we can also call it a tool for analysis and simulation, for analysis, simulation, and modeling. Analysis for anything, because it is capable of uh, uh, doing analysis of uh, ordinary differential equation, um, analytical functions. We can do charting, plotting, and uh, all kind of things which are required for simulation and modeling of any domain, it is possible in uh, in case of Scilab. So it's, it's a very brief introduction about Scilab. I'll also share with all of you uh, my hands-on session, maybe uh, after a break. But first of all, let us go through what exactly is Scilab, how it started, and uh, uh, what are the various functionalities and features associated with Scilab. So we are going to start with the brief introduction, then uh, I'll also share with you that uh, it's available in dual modes. You can run it using cloud or you can install it free of cost from uh, its website, install it on your desktop. Its source code is also available. You can do the changes, you can uh, add the libraries, you can create your own libraries, share your libraries with the, the world. Uh, then uh, what is the desktop interface? What are the various uh, parts of uh, desktop interface, then basic constructs and operations which are possible through Scilab, predefined variables, complex arithmetics. It is very easy to perform complex arithmetics uh, once we define the equations. Then uh, there are workspace related commands, arrays, vectors, Scilab coding editor is there in case you want to create a complete program. Then what are the generally available functions, looping statements, polynomials, plotting and charting. So we'll be discussing all these things one by one. So Scilab software, uh, it started from France. It's not Indian, but uh, IIT Bombay took up uh, a project to promote it because its source code was available. And uh, it's, it's used in all major strategies. is in all major strategies, scientific areas of industry, services such as space, aeronautics, automotive, energy, defense, finance, transport. Uh, the Scilab team at IIT Bombay, India, it uh, aims to increase the use of Scilab in educational institution across India. The primary focus of our effort is to help educational institutions shift from using priority packages to using Scilab. Uh, the competitor packages are uh, uh, MATLAB, R, Python, you can use any of them in, in, in place of all those things. You can also use Scilab. And it's a wonderful tool and very easy to learn, quick to learn. Scilab, it's a it's major component of OC, free and open source software for education projects. So the details are available on scilab.org for, you can go there for more details. It features includes 2D and 3D graphics, animation. It allows linear algebra, sparse matrices, polynomial, rational functions interpolation, approximation, simulation includes includes the uh, ordinary differential equation or then dynamically analytical equations. X course is there, hybrid dynamic system modeler and simulator is there. Uh, classic and robust control, it has got classic and robust control, differentiable and non-differentiable optimization. 
it has got capabilities for uh, signal processing image processing you can run code in parallel uh, using cloud then you can also interface um, instruments instruments modeling and control can be done data analytics and statistics a wide variety of packages are available uh, it allows serial communication with the devices so that data can be directly fed into uh, the sci lab uh, because the source code is available and a lot of documentation is also available um, it's widely used in uh, educational uh, domain it has got gi builder physics real time simulation is there number theory numerical maths interface with computer algebra maple package um, it it gets interface with maple package for scilab code generation uh, it get wonderful interface with fortran tcl tk c c++ java labview and there are many other areas in which it can be used this is the kind of uh, graphs which can be plotted using scilab um, uh you can see that uh, right from 2d to 3d and uh, multi dimensional graphs all those things can be plotted we will also see a couple of uh, these plots and graphs in our uh, coming slides typical usages include uh, in educational institutions maths and computation algorithm development modeling simulation visualization scientific and engineering graphics export to various whatever graphics we generate it can be exported to various formats so that it can be included into documents application development can be done uh, including gui building um it was promoted by iit bombay spoken tutorial and tutorial and video certifications are available free of cost at this website spokentutorial.org uh, cloud version is also available which is uh, you, if in case you are not interested in installing it on your desktop you can uh, use its cloud version which is also available free of cost it's available on cloud.scilab.in latest version can be downloaded from scilab.in or scilab.org in is uh, the indian version of uh, scilab where is scilab.org uh, gives you the global version of scilab although there is no such difference between both the latest version being uh, uh, scilab 6 this is the interface um, of desktop version i'll also show you how it looks uh, once the slides are over uh, on the left hand side there is a navigator bar uh, here we can write the this is the uh, coding editor this one Uh, here the graph output can be displayed uh, you can write your codes there you can assign your variables create your variables so whatever variables are created uh, and whatever values are assigned to them it it is uh, displayed here and whatever commands have been executed it it is on the bottom right corner bottom right corner it is shown as a history all the arithmetic operators are available as such plus minus multiplication division left division uh, power power is same as that of uh, raised to power then we can also use transport or conjugate it you, we can use scilab as a calculator uh, simply uh, on the prompt itself we can write uh, 6 plus 5 uh, uh, let me show you the power of scilab uh, i think I, i should start from there itself so this is the interface as i have already shown uh, dis uh, discussed that uh, on the left hand left hand side this is a navigator where we can uh, go to various directories and folders this is the uh, the the console where we can write the commands um, and it works like a simple calculator uh, we can give commands and it it works like this simply
then whatever variables are uh, assigned any value it gets stored on the top right console it is there if no value if no variable is assigned no variable is declared its values are stored in default variable which is its name is answer this is the command history console and uh, in case you want to have any help on any kind of commands it is available on the question mark just uh, click on the question mark and help is available so this work is a calculator simple calculator also as i have already shared with you then uh, in case of scilab any line which ends with two dots is considered to be start of a new continuation line any line which begins with the uh, slashes is considered as scilab as a comment and is ignored more than uh, one command can be entered on the same line by separating the commands by semicolon or uh, comma so basic constructs include uh, in scilab everything is a matrix all real complex boolean integers strings and uh, polynomial variables are matrices scilab is an interpreted language which implies that there is no need for declaration there is no need for declaration uh, of a variable before using it variables are created at the moment where they are first set in scilab equal sign is uh, called assignment operator x equal to 10 for example in uh, our in our editor i can uh, use this command x equal to 10 and this very this value is assigned to x and it is there it is shown here that this data type is double uh, local variable is there memory Uh, the um, the amount of memory it is consuming variable names may be as long as user want but only first 24 characters is taken in, into account and scilab is a case sensitive language so small a is different from uh, capital a so uh, this is small x in case of capital x it will be a totally different variable as you can see here capital x and small x all these mathematical functions are available sin cos tan um, exponential maximum log functions sin functions square root square uh, all the all kind of functions are available by default uh, there are certain predefined variables which are right protected we cannot change uh, these variables these are uh, for example the value of pi is there epsilon infinity not a number co complex numbers polynomial variables we'll see a couple of examples related to these variables also in the coming uh, slides there are comparison operators and or not uh, the compar the comparison between two variables can be done using double a or single a uh, less than equal to greater than equal to not equal to not equal to can be uh, can be used using two kind of operators tilde equal to or less than greater than signs Uh, less than greater than less than equal to greater than equal to the general commands include clo update versions so if i want to um so if i want to know the time it is available along with date if i want to know the date it is uh, we just need to write date and it is available what version i am using it is uh, 6.1.0 windows 10. Um, it is installed on windows 10.10 and this is the environment which is on which it is being written then uh, there are commands related to who it tells me all the variables which are currently in the scilab work then uh, who's uh, same as who who provides more information on size type then clear 
is used for uh, clearing the killing the variables clear xyz kills the variables these variables xyz specific variables clc clears the screen uh, we'll be using this clc uh, number of times clf is for clearing the figure window the chart window which we will drawing in the coming um, uh, slides diary is used uh, uh, the is used to list down the current commands which we have uh, executed so far uh, otherwise uh, because we have just cleared so no commands is available then uh, print working directory pwd is there i mean this directory but we can always change this directory to any other directory using simple cd command quit is used for uh, quitting scilab exit same as quit command See, uh, in case of uh, Scilab, all the variables are all the variables are uh, stored in the form of arrays or matrices. So, whether they are one-dimensional matrix or two-dimensional or multi-dimensional matrices, but all the variables are in the form of matrices only. So, let us try to assign some matrix here and use those matrices. Suppose I want to assign numbers one to ten to A. It is there. It's simple 1 to 10 A is equal to 1 to 10. And if I want to assign the numbers with some stepping, say uh, B equal to 2 with a stepping of 2 to 20. So these numbers are assigned 2, 4, 6, 8 up to 20. And there's no such as such, there is no limit. Uh, on the last size of the number to which it can be assigned. Maybe if I want to assign number from A to say 1000. The numbers get assigned in a fraction of seconds. In case I want to, this is a this is a row vector. In case I want to assign the uh, numbers into column vector, it can be assigned with the help of uh, uh, semicolons. Suppose A equal to, so all the values uh, get separated by semicolon, uh, gets assigned into a column formation. Then it's not that I can assign numbers into ascending order only. I can assign numbers into descending or num, uh, order also. A equal to from 100 to with a stepping of uh, say minus 10 up to 1. So from 100 to 10 numbers are assigned with a stepping of minus 10. I can also use uh, complex numbers uh, based arithmetic in case I want to use an uh, a, suppose uh, there, there are two variables, suppose x equal to three plus four iota. Iota is given by uh, percentage i. So this is one complex number, y is equal to uh, five plus six iota. Now, if I want to multiply both the number, both the complex numbers x and y, it's simple x into y. I can assign it to a third variable. So z contains multiplication. Then uh, I can divide two numbers, add two numbers, x plus y. So in case of addition, uh, three plus five, eight, and four, six, ten, iota. Subtraction can be done. So basically all the arithmetic operations can be performed. One a complex number can be divided by another number. With this facility is generally not available in most of the other platforms. Um, now, if I want to add, suppose A is a matrix, this is the matrix. I want to add all the values which are stored in A. 
so you just need to write some a and it's done i want to calculate the average so all these statistical functions are available how many how many elements are there in a and what is the maximum value and minimum value those thing can also be calculated if i want to uh, do the product calculate the product of all the elements within a it is also done uh, i want to check the sign of the vector a this see we are performing all these operation on this vector a so sum of all these numbers is 550 mean average of these numbers are uh, 55 length is uh, there are 10 elements in this vector maximum of this number is 10 uh, product of all these numbers is this then uh, i can uh, also find out the sign of uh, what are the signs of these numbers all numbers are positive in case any of the number is negative it it would have been uh, it would have been um, negative here um we can uh, do the ceiling function all those functions mathematical functions which are generally available in uh, other languages they are also available here ceiling floor around sorting searching all those things can be done here i'll be sharing this slide uh, uh, with the organizers also they can uh, share it with uh, all of you so that you can take it up in case uh, i define a matrix a equal to suppose uh, these are 4 5 7 and suppose there is a 3 by 3 matrix i have declared a matrix a as uh, 4 5 7 7 4 9 2 6 9 i have uh, move my window to a little right side because uh, uh, in order to make both the screens visible other otherwise whatever variables are being calculated the, those values are being stored here whatever new variables are created those very those variables are also there and history uh, window get it's it's having the history of all the command whatever is being typed here without their results so suppose uh, now i want to do the sum of uh, certain uh, rows and columns if i want to do the sum of uh, all the elements of this matrix it's simple sum a a is a, a is a 3 by 3 matrix sum of all the elements now if i want to do the sum of uh, a uh, of the all the columns it's done maybe if i want to do sum row wise it's also done so 13 15 18 7 so, uh, 4 uh, 11 plus 2 13 and this the, the sum of these columns um, 15 then 18 accordingly the sum column wise 16 20 10 once uh, we define a matrix we can uh, perf- we can pick up any element out of this um uh, matrix using simply defining the uh, row and column at second row third column it's 9 second row and third column it's 9 a 2 3 uh if i want to pick up all the um rows all the rows of second column so just need to write a column comma 2 2 is the second column and uh, all the values are uh, picked up in the second column if i want to pick up uh, all the columns of uh, second row so 749 so all the values of 
second row 749 it's there uh, maybe i can uh, pick uh, i can pick up a sub matrix out of the main matrix let me write again a so that a1 comma 2 So A one to two five seven. Uh, so how many rows are there? And it it it, is, it helps me in uh, picking up a set matrix of uh, main matrix. So if there is a matrix of hundred by thousand by thousand uh, order, it can be it can be um, a sub matrix can be picked up from it. If I want to know the diagonal, if I want to create a diagonal identity matrix. Uh, just need to write how big matrix I want to make. Diagonal identity matrix. And uh, I want to create a identity matrix of order maybe five by five. Once, five by five, it's done. It's so simple to work with this. Uh, and these facilities are not available in, uh, uh, in Excel zeros and uh, some matrix it can be done once the matrices are uh, defined we can easily add numbers suppose i suppose this is a matrix i create another b matrix equal to ones of uh, three by three and Now, if I want to add both the matrices A and B, so just need to write A plus B and the things are done. Want to multiply it, multiply both the matrices, done. Want to find out the inverse of matrix A, determinant of A. So this is uh, just three by three matrix. On the similar lines, uh, we can calculate the um, sum determinant product of matrix of any order, be it uh, three by three or 10 by 10 or 100 by 100 or 1000 by 1000. Uh, sometime back, I uh, worked on a data which was uh, uh, which was having matrices of uh, 10,000 rows and uh, 1000 columns. So it, it worked perfectly in no time. It was, it was giving results it's quite fast. No need to configure anything. I want to create a matrix of random numbers. Let us say C equal to Ren a matrix of random numbers again three by three so and it's done now i want this is a matrix i want to multiply this a matrix with a matrix of random numbers i want to store this matrix a into c and that's it so now the d contains sorry d contains the value of all the multiple uh, a into c i want to pick up diagonal elements of A. Let's pick up diagonal elements. Let's let me first diagonal elements of D because it is very close. So diagonal elements 4.6.27, 4.2, 10.6, 7.5. Uh, if I want to pick up the elements of upper diagonal, which are nine and 16, I just need to add comma here, one here and the elements of upper diagonal matrix are done. I want to pick up the um, lower diagonal elements. Just need to write minus one and lower diagonals are done. 4.5 and 5.9, it's there. Um, inverse can be done. Okay, inverse, I've already done. Trace of matrix trans or transpose of matrix can be done. These are the things which are uh, really essential for uh, solving any differential equation. Vector and matrices, all these operations are possible in case of matrices. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Okay, I have not shown you the division. So maybe uh, this is the A matrix, this B and this is C. Let us uh, divide A matrix with C and done. 
if i want to raise all the elements of uh, say matrix a with uh, two i want to scale Uh, a gets a, a square is there. A square means uh, A gets multiplied with A. Uh, if I want to multiply this, uh, all the elements of this matrix with two, it's done. So div similarly, division or transport or conjugate can also be calculated. Now let us move to Scilab Editor. It's a wonderful facility in case of uh, Scilab, which uh, allow us to write our code and store the code. In the form of .sc or .sci files, and Uh, I think I uh, start the sail up again. Now all the menus are available. So in I can open the notes window here and uh, um, I can write all the programs here, A equal to say whatever I've uh, done in my previous window. The commands are still available in the history window. So I pick up this and move to this. So matrix A is done, B is equal to um, a matrix of ones, which is of order three by three, and C is a matrix of uh, random numbers, again of three by three order. I want to do multiplication, C equal to say uh, A into C, and now I want to execute. First of all, I want to save it somewhere. I want to save this code. It can be saved with the extension of .sce or sei. Uh, now I can execute this from there itself. It is getting executed, but it's not uh, showing result. And display D because it will do only that much work which it will be told to do. So matrix A and multiplication of a and C, which is in D, is being displayed here. So we'll come back to this. And accordingly, we can create the complete program here, right here. Uh, save the program so that we can later on use it again. So let's go to the interpreter window, console itself. When several commands are to be executed, it may be more convenient to write these statements in a file with Scilab editor. Uh, to execute the commands repeated in such a file, the ex execute function can be used followed by the name of the script as uh, it was being done here, execute, execute this program. We give the program test.se name. 
this file generally has the extension .sc or sci depending on its contents files having .sci extension are containing scilab functions and uh, executing them loads the function to scilab environment but doesn't execute them whereas .sce extension are containing both scilab functions and executable statement executing a .sc file has generally an effect such as uh, computing several variables and displaying the results in the console creating 2d plots read, reading writing files and many more things we can also create uh, dynamic functions in case of uh, um, in case of scilab let us try to create a function as per our requirement. The, the uh, syntax is you just need to write function and the variable which where you want to um, get the value and the name of the function say uh, I want to calculate the cube of a variable which is passed on to it which is x and uh, this d is equal to x into x into x, or maybe it can also be written as x um, double star 3 or x raised to power p and end function. Once the function is defined, I can uh, I can use this function to calculate the values. Just call this function. This is the name of the function cube and the whatever parameter I pass on, it will calculate the cube. On the similar lines, I can make very complex functions uh, which contains um, complicated calculations. Uh, the beauty is you need not declare any variable. You need not uh, define what is going to be the size of the variable. You just start using the variable as such they are available on the platform. You assign the values, uh, those whatever uh, values are assigned plus the name of the variable itself will be available to you in the top right window. This is variable browser. Uh, all the variables which have been created so far what is uh, what is the value stored in them? Uh, what is the type? Uh, what is the visibility? It's local or global, and how much memory it is consuming? All these things are uh, shown displayed in the top right window. So, accordingly, a uh, number of loop statements are also there. Loop statements in the sense that. Um, in case we want to do certain operations repeatedly, we need to write them in a loop format. Uh, let us try to create a small program where we want to calculate this function. Uh, the initial number is four, and the next number in the sequence is given by um, adding two n plus three into this. Uh, calculate 20 terms for a sequence. Now, there are two kinds of loops. Uh, one is for loop. In case we want to, we, we know initially how many iterations are there, means how many number of times this calculation has to be done. Uh, in this case, it is given 20. So we are in such cases, for loop is used, whereas in other cases where we do not know how many iterations are to be done initially, we, we want to execute the set of statements until or unless certain condition is uh, satisfied. In that case, we use while loop. So let us uh, try to run a small program using for loop. So you one is assigned a value of four. Let me clear the screen. So let us assign u one is equal to four. For uh, we already know that uh, the loop has to be the statements are to be executed twenty times. Calculation of twenty times for n equal to one to twenty. Uh, the next step is given by u n plus one is given by 
u n plus two. Uh, the statement is u n plus one plus two into n plus three. Two into n plus three, and uh, whatever number is generated, I want to display that number. And that number should be nth number is u n and and bingo, it's done. So the number is, uh, so the loop is run 20 times. So initially it generates four, nine, then uh, the complete sequence is generated four, nine, 16, uh, 25, 36, 49. So this is, a, this is one of the simple function uh, which need to be created or run. And once it is there, we can easily uh, run it. It's not very difficult to uh, create functions like this in case of Scilab, whereas uh, such things are a little difficult on other platforms or they consume a lot of space and uh, time uh, before they can be created. Now let us try to complete a small example of while loop also. While loop is generally used when we initially do not know how many number of times um, this particular set of instructions are required to be executed again and again. We just want to execute all the instructions within a block until or unless uh, a condition is met. So I planted a Christmas tree in 2005 measuring 1.2 meter. Uh, it grows 30 centimeter per year. I decided to cut it when it exceeds seven meter. In what year will I cut the tree? So uh, simple. Uh, let me clear the screen again. So initial height is given by uh, 1.2 meters. So let us assume one, uh, assign one h equal to 1.2. And initial year is given by 2005. Uh, let us put all the instructions in the loop while h is less than seven. h equal to each year the height increases by 0 0.3, h equal to h plus 3. And uh, year also get incremented with the increase in height. And so in 2000, so it started with 2.2005. There's a small mistake. Y should be equal to Y plus one. While H is less than seven, H equal to H plus 0 0.3 and Y equal to Y plus one. And display. What is the value of y? Y should have been okay. Y let's just this. Okay. H gets increased, y gets increased. Now I want to display the value of y again and again. And So initially it started with 2005, it will keep on increasing the value. Maybe uh, some logic is somewhere missing. I'm missing some step. So it will keep on increasing its value and ultimately it will be printing uh, uh, in which year its guide height get increased to uh, seven meters. And as soon as it's seven meters, it will come out of the loop.
um, there is no limit to the precision as such in case of Scilab. Um, we can go up to 10 decimal places, 100 decimal places, um, or maybe up to 1000 decimal places. Um, it's very easy in case of uh, Scilab to deal with the polynomials of any order. Um, let us try to create some polynomial equations here. Polynomials can be created uh, in case of Scilab using uh, two kinds of parameters. One, either we can give the coefficients or we can uh, uh, give the roots of the equation and from the roots of equation itself, it creates the polynomial. So let us uh, see the example in both the cases that uh, how the, uh, if, let us uh, see first example with roots of the equation. Let's see if roots of the equation are minus one and two, what is the polynomial? P1 equal to polynomial, its roots are, create a polynomial, its roots are minus one and minus two. And equation should have x as a variable. So it has created this variable, uh, this polynomial p1 is equal to 2 plus 3x plus x square. So this is this is the equation whose roots are minus 1 and minus 2. Um, the same equation can also be written as that roots are given. Or I can uh, um, I can uh, define the coefficients of the polynomial p2 equal to I want to create polynomial. Its coefficients are uh, let's create the same uh, uh, polynomial two with the coefficients two, three, and one here. Two, three, and one. The variable being x, and now. In this case, it is not root, rather these are the coefficient values. So two plus three plus three X plus X square. The equation is done. So P1 is, sorry, P1 is this equation. Uh, let us create another equation with, with the different coefficients. So this is another equation, P3 is another equation. So we know P1 is two plus three X plus X square and uh, P3 is four plus three X plus two X square. Uh, let us try to multiply these equations. P1 into P3, done, bingo. Uh, add two equations. It's, in, it's so simple, uh, just need to create polynomial equation. And uh, once the equations are there, we can easily uh, do all kind of operations on these polynomial equations, whether it is addition, subtraction. Okay, so let us do subtraction. Subtraction, multiplication, division. Division, uh, we can assign this to P4 equal to P1 divided by P3. So now P, P4 equation consists of this equation, which is a division of two polynomial equations. Once uh, an equation is defined, we can easily calculate the roots of the equation. Let us try to find out what are the roots of, uh, okay, uh, multiplication of these two equations roots of P1 multiplied by P3. These are the roots of the equation, which otherwise is uh, difficult to find on other platform, but here uh, it's straightforward.
can we compare two equations also p1 is equal to p2 yes p1 is equal to p3 if these are two different equations why because p1 we defined as 2 plus 3x plus x square whereas p3 was 4 plus 3x plus 2x square whereas p2 was p1 and p2 was same whereas p3 was different so that's why when we compared p1 with p2 it is true when we compared p1 with p3 it's false i want to find out the coefficients of uh, coefficient matrix of any uh, uh, let me first of all uh, assign the multiplication into some variable p1 p5 equal to p1 into p3 let us try to find out coefficients of uh, this p5 Bingo. So P5 is uh, the equation with these coefficients 8 plus 18x plus 17x square plus 9x cube plus 2x square. And the coefficients, simple coefficients P5, it gives me all the coefficients. Uh, I want to want to know the first derivative of this uh, equation P5. Done. So 4 to the 8. 3 9s are 27, and the, of course, the power gets reduced. Uh, 17 to the 34, 18 as such is there, x is removed. So one power is less, and this gets power gets multiplied with the coefficient. So the first, let us derivate it again, assign it to some variable, let's say p6. p6 is equal to and uh, let us try to find out the derivative of the same equation again. It's done. So, 8, 3 is a 24, 27 to the 54, and 34 is the coefficient, last coefficient after derivation. A number of such formulas are there. Similarly, we can also find out uh, the integration within the limit we can divide uh, the two polynomials with each other with reference to each other then multiply it them add them subtract them perform any kind of operations which are uh, allowed in um, general mathematics see it's complex variables be it uh, equation with complex variables, be it an equation with polynomials, we can perform simple uh, calculations using all these equations. We can also do uh, polynomial curve fitting using uh, these equations. A typical experiment collects data related to a parameter, say x, and the corresponding values of a dependent variable, say y. Now, these observations can be stored in two vectors, namely x and y. Using least square regression, it is possible to compute the coefficients of a polynomial function uh, of some selected degree of y in terms of x. The equation for a polynomial degree of n can be expressed in the form of uh, a1. The, the, the same we have uh, we have seen the same kind of equation in our earlier slide, that the equation can be expressed in this format. Once the equation is expressed in this format, uh, the, the coefficient matrix can be created. Once this coefficient matrix is created, um, we can find out uh, 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 the, the, the solution of the equation with the help of this. That is x a is equal to b. And uh, the values of a can be calculated using x inverse b. Uh, let us try to find out. Um, we created one matrix B A. Suppose this is a coefficient matrix and uh, another matrix is uh, say X is equal to X1. X2. C.
Suppose this is a metric matrix. Uh, now uh, let me define another matrix. Say B is equal to uh, four. Uh, let's take a little bigger numbers. Say twenty-five, forty-five, and uh, four. Some arbitrary numbers are there. So there's a, there are three mat uh, matrices. One is A. Um, this is the equation which I'm trying to explain, A x equal to B. So there's a matrix A, then uh, X is another matrix, B is another matrix. I want to calculate the values of X. Uh, now this X can be calculated when this A is moved to the right side. This is moved to the right side and uh, inverse is calculated and multiplied with this B vector. So this is uh, the uh, inverse of uh, A, it's get multiplied with B and the result is there. So basically X1 is 11.72973, X2 is 3.67, uh, X3 is these values. So the metric solution can be easily found out using uh, uh, this uh, uh, Scilab. And uh, the, another wonderful thing, plotting the graphs. Let us try to draw simple plots. Okay, before moving to the uh, graph plotting, I have been moving very fast. Let's let me uh, share with you whatever we have discussed so far. We started with uh, whatever the whatever are the functionalities of uh, Scilab features, the kind of graphs which can be plotted, the typical usage which is available using this Scilab. It can be downloaded free of cost from uh, Scilab.in or Scilab.org. Then. Uh, um, and you need not even install it on your desktop. It's also available in the cloud format uh, on this link, cloud.scilab.in. Then I explained uh, the kind of interface which is available. This is, uh, um, this is the navigator bar which tells in which folder I'm working. This is the console where I write the commands. Uh, this is a, a variable browser. It stores whatever variables I have created, what are the dif what are different types of variables, what is the value, how much memory is being consumed by this variable. Uh, this is the history, command history window. Uh, it stores whatever commands I have executed so far. It keeps uh, 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 storing there one after another. And this is the console window. This is a uh, sci notes uh, or editor, which, which can be used for writing program and storing it dot uh, sce file or sci file sorry this is a console window where i can uh, write my programs um, directly then all the arithmetic operators are available directly it can work as a calculator as we have seen uh, on the prompt itself i can keep on writing equations and uh, getting the solution in a fraction of seconds Bas all the basic constructs are available all the basic uh, functions are available, be it uh, exponential, logarithmic, modular, square root, uh, sine, cos, tan, and related to those. Then certain variables are fixed. Um, uh, I've already uh, explained the percentage i, this is a imaginary unit or iota, which is also known as, which is equivalent to a square root of minus one. Pi uh, we'll be exploring just now. Exponential will, I'll also just ex explain you one of the example. Otherwise it can be simply written percentage e and the value is there, percentage pi and the value is there. Uh, but iota is iota. It helps in creating an uh, equation which is of complex nature. Then true values, polynomial variables, um, comparison operators are there. 
uh, we tried with different kind of uh, commands which help us in uh, understanding the sy system as such. Uh, what is the time? What is the date? And what is the Scilab version I'm using? The workspace, um, the clear command I've been using um, frequently, for example, CLC. It clears the whole screen. Uh, clear, I'll show you. There are a couple of variables which are displayed on the top right screen. If I write clear, all those variables will be uh, deleted or killed. Uh, diary gives me the list of current session commands which have uh, been given. CLF, uh, when we'll start, when we'll start plotting graphs, clears the plot window. Directory command are there. I can create com uh, directory either from the navigator bar. I can create uh, uh, directories here, or I can also move between directories, or I can move between directories using uh, cd command. So I was in HP directory. I've come out of the HP directory. Now I'm in uh, uh, C users. CD again, I'm in C drive now. So accordingly, uh, we'll keep on changing. I can go to any, any uh, folder from there itself. So C uses is my current folder now. Uh, quit is used for quitting out of the Scilab. Exit is same as that of quit. We started with creating the arrays, vectors, and matrices. We played with the vectors. Once the vector is defined or matrix is defined, sure. vectors can be uh, can be defined with the help of uh, defining. Uh, starting and ending values, or I can also introduce the stepping steps after which this uh, will be the next number will be generated. For example, in case of A1 to 11 with a stepping of two. So the first number is going to be one after as with a step of two, three, five, seven, and it goes up to 11. Or the number can also be generated in the re uh, reverse uh, sequence. So uh, complex numbers can also be generated. We can do the summing of all the numbers. Length can be calculated, minimum, maximum, uh, vectors and matrices can be calculated. Matrix, diagonal matrix, identity matrix. The elements above, the diagonal, the elements below the diagonal in the matrix, determinant, trace of matrix, inverse of matrix, transpose of matrix, not complex programming is required. All the functions are available in a simple uh, English. Once the matrix is defined, we can uh, perform all kinds of operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, uh, scilab, Editor is there in case I want to uh, write the complete program. The extension of the program will be stored as .sc or .sci. I can also create my customized functions with the help of uh, this is function. This is the intermediate variable which is used to store the intermediate values. This is the name of the function and the parameter which is used to pass on the value to the function. Um, now, with, now this function is defined as my function and uh, y is equal to two into x. x is the input parameter, which will uh, be returned to y. Now I can call this my function with a value of three. So three gets multiplied with this two and assigned to y, which is a return value. So y is equal to six here. We also did for loop in case our number of iterations are Predetermined, we can uh, use the for loop or we can go for while loop. 
precision is available here up to 100 decimal places polynomials uh, we can define the polynomials i shared with you how we can create polynomials I, either with the help of roots if we know the roots uh, polynomials can be created very easily or if we know the coefficients then also polynomial can be created now once the polynomials are created these polynomial equations are there p1 and p2 once these polynomial equations are there we can uh, find out the roots of the polynomial equation or we can perform all the mathematical operations on polynomials addition multiplication division we can do the comparison of those polynomials we can pick up the coefficients from these polynomials uh, we can do the uh, differentiation of these very these uh, polynomials directly uh, without writing even a single line of code just uh, write derivative and p1 and the and the, the the first order differential is find out do the division portion do the numerical calculation we, we can also do the curve fitting uh, now the next topic is going to be plotting and charting uh, uh, in case of plotting and charting uh, now let me clear the screen first. Uh, let us first of all define a variable x, which is uh, from 0 to 2 pi. From 0 to 2 pi. Uh, I want a step of uh, pi by 16. So from one to 27 values are generated of X, which its values are varying from uh, one to two pi. And let us try to draw a graph of this um, plot x comma sine x and uh, let us try to plot both the graphs sine and cos Maybe uh, got some. Yeah. Next, uh, same graph is here, y equal to cos x, sine x, and cos x plus sine x. We've got uh, three values plot x comma y Some error has appeared, but it can uh, be drawn. Um, on the similar lines, uh, we can also draw. Okay. Six. 
So both the graphs are drawn. Uh, I can also define the color option that what color is to be given to which graph. It can be done. Red and blue, it's already there. The kind of uh, labels I want to use here. So in, in case of sine x, I'm using star. In case of cos x, I'm using uh, plus signs, it's there. I can keep on uh, making my plot as per, I can keep on making my plot as complex as I want. So according the Y label, X label, legions, all those things can be inserted here. Now let us try to plot a graph using a function uh, where this function is given by, let me clear the screen for CLF, CLC. Uh, let us define a function y equal to fx, whereas the function is given by y equal to x square plus 2x into e raised power minus x. So y equal to x square x into x plus 2 into x into exponential of minus x and function. And uh, uh, what are the values of x? Let's say uh, the value of x varies from minus two to 50 with a stepping of 50, with a stepping of five. Nine. Once it is uh, x is defined, I can plot the values between x and f. The graphic window. So this is the graph. Let us create another function in, in the same window so that uh, let us introduce another function y equal to gx, whereas gx is given by sine x by two uh, and uh, draw the same graph here in the same window. The function y equal to gx and y equal to sine x by 2. x we have already defined here, line space from minus 2 to 50 with a stepping of 5. And function. And now let us draw that graph. Plot x comma f comma x comma g. Both the graphs are drawn. Let's uh, change the variables of the the points on both the plots. The this first one is drawn using star red color. A lot of documentation is already available from where you can pick up different kind of symbols. This is the blue color and triangles. So the first function fx is, uh, this function fx is 
drawn using star and the second function gx is drawn in blue color with these triangles on the similar lines we can also draw uh, bar charts let's do a simple example of bar chart x equal to 1 to 10 and pick up certain values for uh, n equal to eight We need to define 10 values. Ten. So let us uh, draw a bar chart. Bar chart is again simple bar x comma n. And done. That's it. Similarly, a lot of functionalities are available for uh, um, drawing the labels, marking on the x-axis, y-axis, all those uh, options are also there. Uh, this is just an introductory lecture, not, uh, the, the expert, not to make you expert. That, that's why I'm not uh, discussing the, the advanced things. Then we can have multiple charts in the same graph. We can also plot 3D graphs. Um, it's really simple. And the 3D plots can be drawn with the help of plot 3D family of functions. This is a simplest form requires a grid of X and Y value and corresponding value of Z. The grid of X, Y value is specified with the help of two vectors, one for X axis and other for Y axis. So let us assume that T or X is equal to values starting from zero to two pi. With a stepping of uh, 0 0.3. The values are generated and Z equal to sine T into cos T and once it is done, it is it can be dot C T C. Maybe I made some mistake and uh, but it will it will draw a plot in three dimension. Uh, like this. Then uh, we can draw helix. Zero to Four into pi goes up to hundred values. Um, zero. values are there and run three. A number of charting and graphing libraries are available. Uh, depending on the requirement, you can use any of them. So helix is just drawn. Accordingly, we can also give uh, colors to these to showcase, showcase uh, different dimensions. We can also uh, 
write down the colors or the symbols on which we want to write uh, we want to draw star or uh, uh, triangles a number of other libraries are also available uh, so that was all about uh, plotting and charting uh, but a number of uh, charting options are available as i've already shown you that the kind of charts which are available in case of scilab are heat chart heat maps uh, two dimension chart three dimension charts surface charts mesh charts and uh, so that's uh, that's all for scilab um, i think uh, i was able i have uh, put a list of all the functions which will uh, which will uh, help you in uh, calculating the numer or solving the numerical equations the scilab uh, functions all the scilab functions pro using probability statistics for analysis for displaying plotting charting all those things are based here some of the uh, utility functions. Now, Scilab is a non-commercial open source platform for engineers and scientific computations. So you can use it for any kind of uh, uh, computations. Scilab is ideal for educational institutions, schools, and industries. It's uh, Psychos is better alternate to MATLAB and Simulink. Uh, it can perform mathematical computations, algorithm development, simulation, prototyping, and data analysis using Scilab. A uh, value tool, it's a valuable tool for researcher professional at no little cost. Then uh, I've picked up values, I've picked up the material from these links. It is also available uh, in the last slide as reference. Uh, before saying final thank you, uh, I wanted to show you the online cloud platform. Uh, this is cloud.scilab.in. So on the left-hand side, we can write the programs, say equal to 10, B equal to 20, and uh, C equal to A plus B, and execute it, and it will, the results will be displayed on the right-hand side. In addition to this, there are a uh, number of equations which are already available. Uh, for different areas of uh, uh, engineering education, be it uh, aeronautical, chemical, chemistry, computational, economics. Uh, let us pick up something from civil engineering. So, so maybe test analysis, pick up the book um, uh, for which you have, you know that there are numericals related to this. From which chapter? The ninth chapter, bending of beams, and uh, which example you want to see. So the code is already there. You just need to put in values and execute it. That's it. And there are, uh, in some cases, there are updated versions are also available for these codes. That multiple versions are available. So those things can also be done. So chapter nine, example six, chapter nine, example eight. The codes are already there. You just need to uh, run them, assign the values, that's it. Uh, that's all from my side. Any, any questions? Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Vijay, sir. That was indeed a very wonderful session on Scylla. And uh, um, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, after we are like looking for the MATLAB, and I think after MATLAB, we can, you know, go for Scylla. Uh, so See, MATLAB, uh, MATLAB is a proprietary software where yes. you need to invest a lot of, uh, um, a lot, <laughs> free, but Scylla is available free of course. Okay, okay. So uh, that's good. And uh, just uh, one request that maybe, you know, whenever we are having any practical ses uh, sessions, 
so uh, we actually asked the expert to write their email id on the chat box because uh, while you are uh, you know giving a presentation there might be things that people are writing uh, you know somehow or they want to execute later on and then they will ask any questions or queries related to this particular software so uh, it will be really helpful if you're going to uh, you know mention your email id on the chat box to all the participants definitely just a minute sure sir So my mail ID is uh, brijeshwarapt at uh, mriu.edu.in. You can approach me anytime. Uh, just write a mail to me and uh, uh, give me some time. I'll uh, definitely get back to you in solving your uh, mathematical equations using Scilab. Okay, sir. Uh, so, sir, thank you. And uh, being from a you know civil engineering background, uh, uh, the last uh, uh, you know that uh, you just uh, showed us the application of civil engineering like book wise and all the problems that uh, I think it's going to be really, really advantageous to be very honest. I didn't know about that thing. And, so the, uh, so yes. the code is available uh, as such, chapter wise, book wise, and a yes, yes. couple of books are available. Yeah. Okay, sir. So um, I actually unmuted every uh, participant. So if they want to interact with Dr. Brijesh, sir, they can unmute themselves and have an interaction with sir. Okay, I think, sir, they will be, you know, kind of first uh, doing the coding and then uh, they will be definitely going to get back to you. So uh, I just want to ask, uh, can you share the uh, presentation with us uh, so that we can share with the participants also? So that I'll do that. I'll convert it into PDF and I'll share with you so that sure. you can pass it on to everyone. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for your uh, uh, this wonderful session. I would request uh, Sunita, ma'am, uh, here to kindly uh, give a vote of thanks to you, sir. Uh, Sunita, ma'am. Yes, yes, Yaman, I'm here. Uh, Dr. Brijesh, uh, sir, thank you so much. Thanks a ton. Thanks in kilonewtons. I know uh, how to thank you enough. Uh, our FDP was actually not complete without your uh, inputs into it. And you have done justice to it. Uh, and I can imagine, you know, sitting till five o'clock in the morning and making the presentation only Dr. Brijesh on this earth can do this, sir. Sir, thank you so much. We are totally honored and totally obliged with your gesture, sir. Thank you so much, sir. And it was actually a very comprehensive uh, introduction that you have given us. I'm sure all the faculty members and the participants, they would benefit and they would publish high quality papers uh, using this analysis, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, uh, so um, yes, Vijay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. And okay. uh, wish everybody a good learning and good health. Bye. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So uh, the feedback from attendance from uh, for session number 14 has already been posted uh, in the chat box. So it's a request from my side to kindly fill it up. Uh, and we will be back around 2.30 p.m. for the validatory feedback and assessment. Uh, uh, that is the last, uh, you can say that, the portion uh, for this FDP. And uh, at that moment, I would really request every uh, participant, any interested participant who really want to give their feedback, uh, you know, uh, of all of the FDPs, uh, whatever the findings that you got, and uh, what are the experience about uh, everyone, the, uh, the whole FDP conduction process, uh, the experts, uh, everything. Uh, 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 there is a request from my side that uh, you should turn on your cameras and microphones and give your uh, valuable feedback to us so that in future we will be taking that as a suggestion and we will try to improve ourselves if there is any little bit uh, you know thing just left from our side so thank you so much once again and we will be meeting at 2 40 uh, sorry 2 30 pm uh, for the valedictory session thank you so much <laughs>